I'd like to call the meeting to order. Hector, will you lead us in the pledge? Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Hector. Uh, adoption of the agenda. Any changes, Mr. Superintendent? None. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that the agenda of Monday, March the 12th, be passed and adopted as presented. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, item two, call to the public, uh, University of Arizona Transitions to Teaching Program. Uh, Justin Dutra. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board, Mr. Zimmerman. I'm here today to uh, introduce to you all Sally Holcomb, who is the coordinator uh, for the Transitions to Teaching uh, grant program at U of A South, which is um, a program that we're kicking off this year, hopefully bringing in some, some folks here in the community who have bachelor's degrees so we can get them into the teaching profession with a focus on the STEM-related content areas. Uh, so I'm going to going to go ahead and pass over the microphone to Sally. She's going to make a, a brief presentation on the main points of the Transitions to Teaching program. And we're really here to put the word out. So if you know folks in the community who have a bachelor's degree who are thinking about becoming an educator, this is really the way to do it. Uh, the financial resources are, are there to provide them with the support they would need to get through two years of graduate school. And once they complete the program, they would be not only highly qualified and fully certified, they'll graduate with their master's in secondary education. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Sally. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for um, letting us come and provide this information to you. What we're doing is, is here today just to give you the overview of the program and I'll go ahead and get started with the points. We had a PowerPoint here, so is it? That's the one. Thank you. I know we don't have a lot of time, so I am going to run through these really quickly. You all have a brochure that has uh, my card attached to it. So if you have any other uh, questions that you may have, be feel free to contact me. Also, Dr. Etta Kralovec has been here and has met with several of you. And um, she's also a contact on this, as well as, as Justin, who just came up and presented the program. So um, the to... Um, is it going this way? Let me get my, do I point it? Okay, got it. Okay, so the overview is that this is a five-year program. It's a $2.2 million grant that came out of the Department of Education. It's a federal grant. It's designed to recruit, train, and place new STEM teachers in Title I schools in Cochise and Santa Cruz County. And uh, not right away, we're not starting with this, but we're hoping to add the special education component to the STEM as an offering as well. This will link the resources of the university to border schools through professional development, and it also provides a very robust mentoring training um, for teacher mentors and this is in collaboration with those resources that you already have at your school district um, there are 11 schools involved with this one and um, the Nogales school district is one of those partners okay there there are five target groups that we're looking to bring into the program one is veterans or returning military um, those individuals who are leaving the military and looking for other careers. There's also a program called Troops to Teacher that we're working in collaboration with with those veterans. Local students who are completing college, since this is a five-year school, they need to fall within the, the um, time frame of being able to graduate in time to get into this program as a master's student. Paraprofessionals who are already working in the schools who, have, who are working towards their bachelor's degree or are interested in getting a certification in um, education and want to get the uh, master's program. Mid-career changers and in individuals looking to change um, to go into this uh, field and recruiting um, linked to the district needs. So we're trying to work with the HR directors and your guys' needs that you have specifically to what positions are there and then we will find these individuals and try to match them to what the school needs for the positions that are becoming vacant in your community, in your different districts. 
The programs that are, uh, um, the activities that we're kicking off with right away are that we're recruiting for the first cohort of students right now. The applications became available as of March the 1st, or March the 1st, right? And they'll be due in as of April 30th. So there's a short time here to apply for this first cohort. The kickoff events are happening in Benson, Nogales, and in Bisbee. Nogales events are happening in April, and you'll get uh, additional information about that if you haven't already gotten that. There is mentor training this summer and ongoing. Uh, we're also recruiting those mentors that your school district might have if you've identified some individuals who you think would be a, um, a good match for this program. There are stipends for those mentors at the school. We're also looking for content mentors as well as those who are, are um, really excellent teachers with the, the uh, classroom management and um, just understanding the school system. So then there's also a summer STEM camp, and this is gonna be available for middle and high school students. So um, that's gonna be coming up um, this summer, early to mid-summer, and that's a, that's a week-long event, and that will be held in Douglas. And so if you guys have got some uh, students that you think would fit for that, we'd be happy to um, get them hooked up, and that will give you additional information on that as we get that. Um, the benefits that your district will receive is that you get the access to the highly qualified STEM teachers. Participants must make a three-year commitment to, the, uh, to teaching in a Title I school. They also have access to getting um, resources through the t um, TEACH grant, which is a four-year commitment, so we can collaborate with that. But there are incentives, a, a, up to a $5,000 stipend for those teachers to, um, that agree to make that three-year commitment. Access to professional development for all the teachers in the partnering districts that they fall within the STEM um, topics and we'll be working with you to identify what those professional development needs are that you have that will work with this um, effort. Mentor training for teachers in collaboration again with what you've got. Part of a network of educators committed to improving educational outcomes in border schools. So as much as we can we'd like to link any of the partnering districts together to do events together as, it's, as they see fit and that'll be beneficial. Um, we are looking for your involvement. Um, we want to be very good stewards of this uh, federal dollars, so we're making sure that we can make it as relevant and pertain to the issues that you see that you need, so we want your feedback. Um, we're also trying to meet the needs of the teachers that you have and your students, very unique to each district. We want to um, get you linked with professional development. There's a lot of the uh, resources attached to this grant are for professional development. So we do see that there's going to be some exciting opportunities involved with that, as well as innovative ways to do different things in our communities and schools. And as far as how to get involved, once again, we've left information for you. Um, the business cards, Justin is a contact. Um, we are encouraging any prospective teachers that you know of in your district that might qualify or in, um, that are in, but they cannot be people that already have their certification. They need to be people that are um, looking towards certification. And this supports, um, the participating existing teachers. We've also got um, uh, committees that we can pay for substitutes and then we'll be putting on a lot of public events that once again that we'll be working hand in hand with the districts through the university. So here's our contact information. Um, that's Etta's um, email and mine and if you guys have any question going forward, I realize this is called to the public so you can't ask those now but um, going forward please let us know if you need anything and how we can proceed okay thank you for your time we appreciate your your time and uh, attention on this and we look forward to working with you okay. thank you, okay. thank you. Uh, that's the only uh, notice I got is there anyone else who would like to address the the board that's it okay uh, governing board updates Marcy thank you mr. chairman I would just like to request uh, if the chairman would please uh, ask for a moment of silence in memory of former mayor Florentino Fontes, who was a mayor of this city and a member of the city council, a great advocate for public education. And not only that, uh, his daughter, Norma Amada, helped us out at, at uh, A.J. Mitchell School as an acting principal there. I, he volunteered a lot of time in the community. He was always willing to help out people in the community. And at this time, I would like to ask if the chairman would please have a moment of silence in memory of former mayor Florentino Fontes. 
Shirley Marcy, uh, everyone join me, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have. Update, Mr. Chair. And uh, none here with me. Okay, uh, Mr. Superintendent. <coughs> Okay, superintendent's report under item A, individual <coughs> school reports and Kathy Scott column. As, as the board may recall, uh, a few months ago we had this discussion about how we could better communicate some of the things that are going on in our, our school district. Um, we brought up that once upon a time in Nogales we had a newsletter. We, we promptly explored that option, uh, uh, looked at the expense. Uh, we thought that uh, putting the expense aside, which was a lot more expensive than I thought it was going to be, uh, we, we tried to, to think of some other options. And, and, and we know that once in a while, governing board members might be out at the grocery store and, and get caught on aisle seven by some, some parents who might be disgruntled because they're hearing things that are happening at their schools, rumor or fact. Uh, so what we have decided to do uh, actually, two things is that we are, number one, going to be requesting, it's, I shouldn't use the word request, we are asking that the administrators every month provide to you in your packet um, a, a report as to the good, the bad, and ugly, the things that might be going on, uh, if anything, rumor control, so you have an idea as to what's going on. The other thing we decided to do is it's more with the celebration of the things that are going on in Nogales, and that is that we have Kathy Scott, and um, and and by the the partnership, if if you will, that that uh, she has established with the, um, the the Nogales International newspaper, we have Manny Coppola here has been gracious enough to allow Kathy to put um, articles into the newspaper. Many of those are things that we're doing just to celebrate uh, some of the things, or things that we're um, asking parents to do. Uh, we understand that in reporting that there is a, a negative side at times. And, and I think that uh, what we want is we want to make sure that if, if we can control it other than 2TV is to have some balance in the reporting, that we have, uh, that, that we're not afraid to say that we're not perfect, that there are some things that we need to get better at. Uh, but there are some things that we need to celebrate, and uh, we, we decided that the, the price is right because I don't believe Mr. Coppola has been charging us, so it has been very, very nice to have that in there. And when we feel like that, we, if we can come up with some grant money or some other alternative funds, then I think that we would explore going back to the, the um, issue of having a newsletter. But for right now, we think it works. We've had a lot of very nice comments that have come in about the articles that have been written, and uh, we appreciate the International for allowing us to be able to do that. Okay. Um, the second item that, that you'll see on here is, was, a, was an item that, that came up at a couple, maybe a couple meetings ago uh, by Dr. Verona as a, as a request to possibly host uh, an ASBA event. We promptly got on that, and we have been able to solidify that spot, but there's just one little drawback is that the date that they host that, or they, they put that event on, is on October 10th. If you look at your calendar, that's during fall break. Uh, we're going to explore the possibility of seeing if, if, if there's any problem with them being able to move that date. But as it stands right now, um, we are hosting. Okay, good, good. The third item is not for something for me to read to you because I would have probably put under discussion, but I think it's important during this spring season is the legislative update on school, capital finance, school facilities, property tax, and education in general. You'll note that there's one item on the agenda out of all the House bills that are on there, all the Senate bills. I only want to talk about one because there are some very interesting House and Senate bills. I don't overreact to them, but I, I put this in front of you so you can look at it and at this board meeting when you come down to future agenda items. If there are any of these items that you would like to talk about a little bit more specifically, and maybe by the next month um, there'll be some movement one way or the other, but it was more for your education to know what is going on with some of the, the more crucial House and Senate bills. Thank you very much for that, okay. Mr. Zimmer. 
this this next item item D is probably long overdue maybe three or four years overdue uh, and it is a recognition I'm gonna have dr. Utney come up because it falls within his department and as you know uh, for the last three years we've been hosting a Nogales uh, school district uh, uh, Christmas dinner at no expense to the district <laughs> this has all been through donations the food the gifts the the manpower everybody comes donates the music and uh, we thought that it would be well to have uh, a recognition of those individuals because when you think about it it's a lot of money to put this event on and at no expense to the district and they deserve to be recognized John thank you superintendent board members we've got members of the of our civic organizations here come to be recognized but first we need to recognize one gentleman Santa Claus tell him thank you and of course he couldn't be here tonight because he's North Pole with all the elves getting ready for next year so first off we need to thank him uh, he's very gracious to come and, and spend that time with our families and kids and there was a present for every child that was there and where did we get those well we got the wrapping paper we got the the ornaments we got some film processing from Walgreens that representative would come forward. <coughs> Mr. Pena? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. On behalf of the on behalf of the district, on behalf of all the children, thank you for the donation. Appreciate it, sir. And we'd like to thank the Arizona Rangers. And is it Captain Armando or Commander? Captain, Captain Armando Madrill for a monetary donation and providing security for the evening. Thank you, sir. and the, to the Nogales Fire Department for assisting with the toy drive. Um, we got Fire Chief Hector Robles and Juan Ceballos. And for the food, for the preparation, for the donation, of over 600, I, somewhere in the count of about 620 plates of food, ham, cake, all the trimmings, everything for Christmas for the families donated by Southwest Foods. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you all next year, right? <laughs> And to Manny Felix, high school student, doing his senior project. He was there helping, making sure that everybody uh, had a good time. Kids got presents. Everybody had food and just whatever needed done. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Ms. Mendoza, I don't see anybody else here from the high school for the high school mariachis. But we'd like to thank them for spending time with us and for the musical entertainment. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Romero and her staff were gracious hosts, providing a wonderful evening with a smile. And as usual, whatever needed to get done, she was there and it got done. And do I have somebody here from Penn? Professional educators, there you go. Professional educators of Nogales.
for a monetary donation, and I know that you, you were all there in spirit helping us as we celebrated Christmas. Thank you. And hiding in back, I'll just wave to the camera. Juan Armenta was there for 2TV, making sure that there was a good record for everything that, that transpired. Thank you, Juan, for being there. Also like to recognize Alex Lopez, taking pictures of children with Santa. Um, the district office staff for being Santa's little helpers and wrapping presents. Uh, the NUSD support services staff, setting up tables and chairs, tearing them down. Again, those are all <laughs> donated hours. And last, we need to thank the coach that put all this together and kept everybody going, Angelica Rodriguez. Without her, this would not have happened. Thank you. Let's do this again sometime. Continue. Continue on. Item E, a study session reminder that March 29th, and we've already had um, one conversation uh, since we planned this event with uh, citizens, and uh, we actually have another follow-up uh, meeting scheduled for the week after break. Uh, we believe that it will be very informative and comprehensive. We will talk about the finance piece, uh, the effectiveness and the efficiency of the routes, um, and, and really to dispel some uh, rumors in terms of what is loaded on these buses. Sometimes I think we think that our buses are running uh, one-third full, and uh, so we have asked them to come in and, and put together a presentation. I think it will be uh, very informative for the, for the board. This next item, we have Larry Frederick. This man here can put together some notes because we've been to the summit. We have had uh, a few full day um, uh, discussions where we, we've called out the uh, teachers, administrators to, to really um, uh, get this thing going. And after the second summit, what I took away is No Gallus is far, far ahead of most districts in this state. Mm -hmm. And um, so Mr. Frederick has been taking notes, and his notes are just, uh, where was this guy when I was in college? I would have sat right <laughs> next to him. So, <laughs> uh, Good evening. I, my, those of you who know me know my voice is usually a lot stronger than this, but I'll do the best I can. Uh, the state legislature has required that all districts and LEAs develop a new system of teacher evaluation with at least one-third of that evaluation based on classroom and school assessments, uh, primarily AIMS, Azela, Dibbles, graduation rates, AP tests, and other state-aligned testing methods, and at least half of the evaluation based on observation of classroom performance using new in-task standards, and these are 10 different standards that are important for the 21st century classroom performance. At this point, our committee has uh, determined that we've met several times and decided on a formula of two-thirds classroom uh, observation and evaluation and one-third classroom or school data. Uh, group A teachers are those teachers for whom there is classroom data available. In other words, they have taken the Ames test. They have taken Azela. They, they teach those subjects. Group B teachers uh, are those teachers who do not currently have approved classroom data, and they will be evaluated using school-wide data. Um, as a general music teacher, for instance, I would fall in the group B category. There's no statewide uh, assessment for what I am teaching. So I would use school-wide data as my portion of the data. Uh, the estimates are that currently 31% of teachers across the state would fall under group A. 69% of teachers would be classed as group B across the state. In other words, there is no pertinent classroom data for those teachers yet. Uh, in our district case, most elementary school classroom teachers are group A. A few of the middle school teachers are group A, and the rest of the middle school teachers and all of the high school teachers at both high schools are group B. So they use school-wide data rather than individual classroom data. We attended the summit that, um, that Mr. Zimmerman just mentioned in Phoenix recently, specifically targeting those group B teachers, how to help them move from group B 
to group A because we want the, the teachers to be evaluated on what they teach in their classroom rather than what the school as a whole does. But it's going to take some work to get there. Uh, Superintendent Hoopenthal spoke and I had a lot of very good things. He, he knows data. I'll tell you, he really does. And he knows evaluation. I was very impressed with what he had to say. Uh, but one of the things he said that really impressed me a lot was that effective organizations create positive nurturing environments. We don't need to increase threats to teachers, but find a way to reduce the threats to teachers to almost zero. If we can support and nurture teachers, we can increase their effectiveness. Effectiveness is destroyed by increased threat levels. Uh, another one of the speakers was Dr. Laura Go. I've begun following her on Twitter. And if, if, if there's anything going on about evaluation, she knows it. She's, she's just the top person, as far as I can find, in the country right now. She said that when we do school-wide value added, we are doing away with anything that has to do with what the teacher teaches. Essentially, all of their evaluation comes from observation. So when we have teachers grouped as group B, we're really not evaluating how they're teaching. We're just evaluating what the, what the observations are, not, not data from their classroom. So we need to move towards getting them um, proper assessments, assessments that are effective, assessments that are meaningful, and assessments that are directed towards what they are doing. Uh, Dr. Stanley Rabinowitz was there, and uh, he's a, he is a, an expert on measurements. Uh, he, he, had a, he started with an interesting quote. He says, what is the opposite of feasible? He said, well, in many states, policy is the opposite of feasible. And, and that's kind of what we're finding out right now. We, the state has said, you need to do this, figure it out. And that's kind of where we are, figuring it out. Um, we have assessment numbers for about 31% of our teachers. We need to build assessments for the other 69%. However, we shouldn't take the methods we use for the 31% and apply them to the 69%. In fact, what we need to do is just the opposite. We should learn from the way we assess that 69% so that we can more effectively measure the value of what the 31% are doing. We're going to start with things that we already have because we've got them and we've got to start somewhere. But we need to build broader measurements. We need to build uh, measurements that, that really evaluate individual teachers and their effectiveness in teaching. Uh, he told us four numbers to bear in mind. The numbers 1, 3, 5, and 10. That represents the four stages of the model that we develop. Year 1, year 3, year 5, and year 10. What you do now, what you get to in three years, what you really want to do in five years, and what you finally end up with in 10 years. You need to build an incomplete model. What we start off with is not going to be perfect, and we know that. He said, this is like the house you rent while you're building the house you're going to move into. You, you got to live somewhere. You got to have an evaluation system, and we need to have it by next year. But we know it's not going to be perfect. We know that there's some things that aren't going to be what we want. So we, we move towards that three years. That's going to be closer to what we really want. So that a couple of years down the road, we've got something that will really work. And then hopefully in five years, we've got something that is effective, that is helping us measure what teachers do. Not so we can get rid of teachers, but so that we can help teachers be more effective in their teaching. So that we can find out where even the good teachers can do better, and where the teachers who aren't so good can maybe become performing teachers, can become good teachers. Um, I took away some observations from this, uh, this summit. First of all, we are as in, in as good or better shape than most other districts in the state at this point. And I'm not just talking about districts our size. I mean the big districts. They're, they're really not any further along than we are. They're, everybody's looking, who can we borrow from? Who can we learn from? Well, we're one of the ones some of them are asking, and we're one of the ones that they're learning from. Uh, we have a clear understanding of what Group A and Group B teachers are. I got into a lengthy discussion with a lady who had no idea what the difference between those two teachers were, and I, it just shocked me that she was at the summit and didn't know. Um, we've classed our teachers as either Group A or Group B already. We've um, 
develop proportions for the different assessments that reflect both our goals and reality. Uh, we're already beginning talks on how to move teachers from group B to group A. I had a meeting with the general mu music teachers last Wednesday, and we began the process of how to build assessments that are aligned with state standards, that are aligned with district goals, so that we can move music teachers from group B to group A. It's not going to happen this year, but hopefully in the next year, it'll be there. Um, We've begun work on a teacher evaluation instrument based on the in-test standards as required by the state. Though here we're looking at whether it's more feasible to purchase a ready-made instrument or to develop one on our own based on the, the model that we've already been using, but uh, tweaked, changed, so it reflects those 10 major in-task standards. Uh, we've We've got some of the brightest and best administrators and teachers from our district, all across the district, working on this committee. I, I will tell you, I don't know where we would get a better group of people to work with. They are, they are smart. They, are, uh, they're, they're, they work on their own. I mean, we, we spend full days working on this, but everybody then goes home and studies and works and brings back more information. Uh, it's, it's a great group, and we are in a good place. We're a lot further than most other districts are at this point. Uh, we're in good shape. By the end of this year, we should have something that we can present to the board that I think that will be practical, that will be workable. It won't be perfect. We're going to end up changing it before the next year is over because we're going to find out once we get into it, oh, no, that was a terrible idea. But we don't know. There's, there's no other experience to base it on. Much of the country is in the same boat we are. Uh, the, a lot of this has to do with the race to the top. A lot of this has to do with some of the changes that are being made uh, at the national level and at state levels. But we're in pretty good shape right now, and, and I feel good about where we are. Questions from the board? Well, this is uh, under superintendent's report, but next time we're going to put it under information and discussion. <laughs> but uh, th the actual committee, just so you know, uh, we, we tried our best to get a cross section throughout the entire district. Actually, the principals, I would like to say they nominated somebody. I don't know if they twisted their arms, <laughs> but, but we do have a very good staff. And Larry, mm -hmm. thank you very, very much. Uh, for that presentation. Thank you. Item G and H is the um, student, aux student activity auxiliary operations and summary budget if there are any questions. Otherwise, we're ready to move on to Roman numeral five. I, I, just a, a question. The, the chairman asked on the pre last presentation if there were any questions from the board? And you said no. Now you're asking us uh, for questions for yeah, G and H. I'm, I'm we'll just uh, give you another opportunity during uh, information and discussion at the next board meeting, and okay. we should have probably put it under there. All right. Moving on to item five: information and discussion items. Item A: Happy Hill Incident Report. Uh, <laughs> Happy Hill. Apparently hasn't been so happy, but uh, we have had some dialogue uh, with some some of the authorities here in Nogales. We're going to let uh, Fernando take the lead on this, but we have uh, we certainly have not turned a blind eye on any of the things that you may have been hearing lately, whether it's uh, issues of drugs in our schools, uh, fighting that might be taking place on Happy Hill. So we have not turned a blind eye. And, and we uh, would like to take this opportunity to at least uh, tell you some of the things that we are doing to, uh, to hope that this type of, uh, these type of things don't happen. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Happy Hill. Uh, I think the administration, Miguel's High School administration, is going to cover that uh, in length, in detail. Uh, but it lends itself with uh, what uh, Mr. Zimmerman uh, explained a little bit that we're going to going to be asking the schools to present uh, a report and I think that part of that is where we're starting with Nogales High School tonight. Um, I gave you a letter that we will be submitting to our parents this week. Uh, I sent that information to our principals. Uh, the letter is translated and it's just uh, an awareness as to what is going on at the schools, what is going on in our community in regards to, to drugs and as going back a little bit on, on what was said regarding the media, 
Um, I've also asked uh, Mr. Coppola if he could share this, print this in the local newspaper. The letter is translated for, for our parents, and uh, tomorrow the principals will make sure that they're it's handed out during the teacher-parent conferences. Um, on, a, on a good note, um, to start out with, and, and again, I'm going to give you an overall presentation regarding um, drugs on our, on our schools. This morning, uh, we had an interview from the Tucson Media. And what we shared and some of the interventions that we have in place, and, and the high school will share some of that as well, is that we're actually uh, very proactive when it comes to, to drugs. I've been in this district uh, 20 years, 10 years as a teacher, and 10 years as an administrator. And I want to assure in that letter that the parents are well informed, uh, that everything is highlighted, and that we are transparent. Um, I want to assure the parents in this community that we are not in, in chaos and, and our schools are not drug infested. Um, so today you will hear a little bit of one school and what they're doing and what we already have in place. Uh, the only difference that I see this year uh, is that we have been more exposed uh, to what's going on because we've had a few isolated incidents that have come out. And uh, again, I'm, I'm highlighting that I don't want the, the community to be uh, concerned because these are not cases as uh, earlier, about two weeks ago, I submitted some data to you stating where we were last year, where we were a year ago, and so forth. And uh, to, to be honest, there's, there's not a huge increase. What we have is uh, a situation where we have our middle schools who have some isolated cases uh, who have uh, had students that made that choice, and, and that's what you have seen. And in the last two weeks, we also had a very highlighted uh, student uh, case that, um, that brought that hardcore heroin to our school. Um, and so that kind of got the attention of the community. We're very lucky, at least in the 20 years that I have been in education and, and now as a hearing officer for this year, that that has been the only case regarding this drug. And this drug, we know for sure that this drug was not to be distributed at Nogales High School. It was to continue going north. And that's on a sad note, but on a good note, that's very good to hear. And, and, and that's what the, the letter is, is addressing, as well as what we're telling you tonight. Um, it is an isolated case. Um, it is an issue. We are not denying that we don't have drugs in our, school, but we, in our schools, but it's not more than what other communities have. Uh, the reporter this morning shared with me personally that what she sees as to what we have in place and what we are doing to be proactive, to begin with, we are a zero tolerance on drugs a district, uh, is more than what the Tucson schools, according to her, are what they're doing. Um, that is part of why uh, I interviewed with her this morning, because I don't want it to be perceived differently. Just like the law enforcement and our, and our community leaders are telling back uh, going north to Phoenix that our, our community is safe. And it's not what the news or what the media is reporting, but that we have a very good community and as we do a school community. Most of our kids are good students. We have very good parents. We have a very good school community. I'm very proud to be a parent of, of this community and to have invested as an administrator in so many years and the educators you have here that have done the same. Uh, so with that in mind, again, I wanted to share what's going on and, 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 and give you the facts. Um, I've been communicating with Mr. Coppola as well. We will continue, as Mr. Zimmerman stated, uh, doing a lot of positive reinforcement with Ms. Scott. Um, I'm telling you that out of the 34 cases that we have uh, heard this year, it has been minimal. Uh, it's not something that is huge in numbers. What we have is a combination of middle schools, both high schools, and we had recent group students caught using the drugs. Uh, so that's why you have those numbers. Out of those 34 cases that I have uh, been the hearing officer, not one has been appealed by the parents, which means that the principals are doing a good job in the due process, documentation, providing the evidence, and that everything that has been provided during these hearings have been very accurate. You might have once in a while an appeal, but I'm here to tell you we have not had one, which shows that we are doing what we need to do as a school and as a district. Um, the other part is, is the component that we're in March. 
it's been a good year as a school and as a school district. And when I say as a school, I'm referring to the elementary, middle schools, and high school. You have opened to the public. It is a forum where parents, where students can come and address any issues. None of these issues have been addressed here. If you did have problems, if we did have issues, you would have them here. Again, I don't want you to think that we are in denial. We have issues. We have problems. Last uh, two weeks, uh, the, the, the Nogales International published uh, that it was the highest month of drug bust in our community. You have problems with drugs. It is also a very much a fact that there are recruiting more students to cross these drugs over. That is a fact. And it's out there. And our community needs to be aware that drugs are out there. Uh, Over-the-counter medication are the highest drugs used by our teenagers. And those are at home. That, those are facts. Whatever you have in the community, it's going to be a reflection to our schools. But I, again, I want to assure everybody that it's not more than what we have dealt with before. And I want to commend the high school administration with this high profile case that we recently had. That came from an anonymous call. They didn't have to address the issue. They could have ignored the issue. But they acted like we've always acted. They went directly to that source, and that's how that drug was confiscated. They followed through. They did what they needed to do, and that drug was removed from the school. We followed the due process. We did what we needed to do. We followed procedures, and that student was expelled from the district. Again, these are things that are happening. I don't want you to think that we're here and say it's not happening. It is, but the facts are facts, and we are addressing it and confronting them directly. And in that letter that we presented to you, we'll give you a little bit more of the details as to what we're confronting as a community of Nogales and what our schools and our principals are confronting. That is on top of the academic achievement that has been placed for this school, for this school year with goals and expectations. April is coming up. We're preparing for the AIMS assessments. We are doing our best to make sure that our students are getting the best education that they can. And on top of that, our principals are making sure that those schools are safe in order for them to get what they need to be successful in school. We are also planning for the end of the coming in April a symposium that we will bring together our school district, school officials, law enforcement, everyone within our community to educate our parents, to educate ourselves, and to make an awareness and to make sure that everybody is on the same consistency basis that zero tolerance means zero tolerance at school and everywhere else in the community. So with that, um, I wanted just to give you a little brief uh, information as to what we've been doing, we, what we're working on, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to the high school principal so she can a little bit uh, give us a little bit of Happy Hill. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mr. Uh, board President, Mr. Sum Mr. Zimmerman, and uh, distinguished board members. My name is Ruth Mendoza Jimenez and I'm the principal at Nogales High School. And we've been uh, requested by Dr. Barona to do a presentation on Happy Hill um, at the last board meeting. Uh, first of all, we wanna show if everybody puts their attention to the picture, uh, that's Happy Hill right there on, 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 on the screen. Um, this is on Mariposa, Mariposa Hill's place. And I just want to say that for these purposes, we know there's a lot of happy places in Nogales, and there's a lot of happy hills, and, and a lot of students also refer to Happy Hill, uh, that empty lot behind the, the apartments behind the uh, San Felipe de Jesus Church. Uh, but this is the place where that incident, that fight took place, and, and it was on, on the newspaper. Um, so for these purposes, this is Happy Hill for the purpose of this presentation. Uh, as you can see, this is not on our campus. It's not part of Nogales High School uh, facilities or infrastructure. 
Uh, this is um, between Frank Reed and Mariposa Hills Place. Um, a lot of students go to these places after school. They go after school, after school is dismissed, and usually the students that go there are students that drive, students that ha have their cars and, and drive out off, um, on and off to campus. Um, usually, what are, what are the signs that we look for when we see that something is gonna happen at Happy Hill? Usually, we know that the students, we know which students stay on campus, because we know that they either have practices after school, they have tutoring, so we know what kind of students we have on campus. When we see a big sign of students leaving campus in cars that they're not supposed to, where the cars are packed, we usually have our, our school resource officer by the student parking lot. So he's very, pretty good to catch that and, and, and see that there's something, some kind of activity going on. And so we go and patrol um, Happy Hill and a lot of times we've been able to prevent a lot of things from happening. Sometimes we just get there, the students are hanging out, talking, and as soon as we, they see us, they start leaving. Um, you can see that this is an empty lot and it's chained off. It was chained off two years ago, approximately two years ago. Especially for, I'm, I'm sure by the owners for that same reason, because a lot of the students, they used to go up there and park their cars and just socialize, just, just hang out after school. So now the students, they usually drive up there and they just park their cars on the sides. Uh, we've done it a lot of times, even when Mr. Pilar was principal at Nogales High School, we used to go up there, he used to park his car, and as soon as the students start, started driving up there and, and they saw us, they will turn around and leave. Um, the same thing with Mrs. Bonilla, sometimes she gets on the golf cart and either she drives up there or she drives uh, right in front of San Felipe de Jesus, if we see that there's a lot of activity going on or a lot of students going to that same direction. Um, This is uh, going up. If you go on Mariposa, on Mariposa Hills Place, um, you're gonna have to make a left turn on North Mariposa Hill. And right there, the top of the hill, that's where that empty lot sits. So the students have to drive all the way up and, and that's the hill on the top, that's Happy Hill. That's approximately 0.8 miles away, uh, 0.8 of a mile away from Nogales High School. That's three minutes and I included how to get there to Happy Hill. Uh, I can tell you that we've done a lot of things to prevent things from happening uh, uh, at this place. It's either, just like I said, in front of the church, behind the church, or at Happy Hill. Uh, just like I said, we get information from parents that there's a lot of cars going that direction and and our SRO will, will, will go and, and, and ask for backup so we can clear the areas. And this is not the only place where we get phone calls. We usually, uh, last year we had uh, a few phone calls from the Oasis Cinema, because a lot of students were hanging out or just gathering there, so uh, usually the Nogales Police Department does a pretty good job at uh, notifying Officer De La Osa. So we always follow up with, with anything that happens. Um, I can tell you that we get a lot of information uh, if anything is going to happen, sometimes the students talk to other students, to securities, to the SRO, to teachers, and, and if we find out that there's anything, any rumors of, th of something happening around these areas, uh, we're gonna follow up. We're gonna follow up and we're gonna make every effort possible to prevent things from happening. Um, I wanna take this opportunity also, to talk about how at Nogales High School, we ensure that we have a safe and orderly environment. As administrators, everybody knows that that's their number one priority, to provide a safe and orderly environment. We're gonna uh, take advantage of this time and, um, and we're gonna touch on uh, preventive measures that we do at Nogales High School. What do we do with information that we receive? Uh, what do we do with investigations? How do we follow up with each incident or with each case that is reported to us? How do we impose discipline? And last but not least, how do we refer the cases to our SRO and what, which cases are referred to, to our resource officer? But before I touch on those things, um, 
I just want to talk to you a little bit about the things that we already have in place at Nogales High School. And just like Mr. Prada said, uh, we have to make sure that we provide teachers that are highly qualified, that we have the best instruction going on in the classrooms, that we provide professional development for the teachers, for staff, but we also have to make sure that we reach out for the students. And, and, and sometimes these things are not tested on a, on a, on a state assessment, but, but it's still part of our responsibility. Um, I've been at Nogales High School for the past two years uh, as part of the administration, and these are things that we've done in the past. Uh, we had parent presentations about, se uh, about sexting presented by our county attorney, George Silva. We had student presentation on, on Katie's Law. This is the abusive teen uh, dating law. It was, it was presented by Katie's mother. We have teachers and, and, and staff presentation on drug awareness provided by Nogales Police Department. We had student presentations on Operation Detour. This was a presentation information on drug smuggling, cartels, operations, and the consequences. It was provided by uh, the Border Patrol. We have student presentations on safe graduation celebration, and this is provided by Nogales Police Department. We have student presentations on gun safety and awareness. This was presented by Nogales Police Department. We have student presentation on drunk driving and their effects. This is presented by our, our, our um, school resource officer. We have ra random and, and frequent canine searches. Our motto promotes student safety. As Dr. Barona recalls, he established this motto uh, back in 1995 uh, that said, don't forget to buckle up. This is still our motto. It's, it's posted everywhere on campus. We remind our students every day. Um, we have student presentations on waiting for Superman. This was academic awareness and, and how to make better choices. Uh, we had a district-wide presentation on sexting. This was uh, offered by uh, County Attorney George Silva. We have student pre-prom activities. These are done by our SAD club. And last but not least, we have student and parent class meetings to go over uh, requirements and also expectations. And we do this at the beginning of the school year with every single class, and we also do it throughout the year. Just like Mr. Prada said, yes, we have seen an increment on, on the numbers of suspensions, and I have the, the, the data from the past three years that we've been at Nogales High School. Uh, you can see long term, in order to long term suspend a student, they, they, some of the basic things that we, when we file for long term suspension is either they um, brought weapons to, to school, they, uh, there was um, illegal substances on campus, or it was aggravated assault. So I can tell you uh, in 2009, 2010, we have 12 uh, long term suspensions. Last year, we had 14 long-term suspensions, and this year, 18 so far, and with one expulsion. I'm going to have um, Assistant Principal Cesar Miranda talk to you a little bit about preventive measures and information received. Good evening. Thank you, Mrs. Jimenez. Uh, preventive measures. Being an administrator at Nogales High School, uh, we spend a lot of our time being proactive, trying to avoid as much negative issues as possible. Mrs. Jimenez talked about several things that we have in place to be proactive. Um, I'm going to talk about a few more. Regarding uh, class meetings, we hold several class meetings throughout the school year. Uh, during those class meetings, we not only talk about academic achievement and academic expectations, but we also talk about things like rules and regulations. Uh, if a student doesn't follow those rules or regulations, there are consequences in place for those students. And we try and get that across to our students as often as possible. Also, in the summertime, when students register for classes, they are given a board-approved disciplinary matrix. And the first few days of school are dedicated by teachers going over those disciplinary matri matrices with those students so that they understand uh, the expectations of them at Nogales High School. Also a big issue uh, at Nogales High School is our lunchtime. We try and be very proactive at lunchtime as well. On occasion we will have 
the Nogales Police Department uh, bicycle officers on campus, roaming the campus. We also have several, all of our counselors out and about during lunch. Uh, several teachers give up their lunch to provide some extra eyes uh, on our students and also of course administration is, is present during every lunchtime. Uh, regarding information received, uh, as an administrator, it is our goal to serve, to create a safe learning environment for every single student on campus. With that said, if an issue crosses our desk, whether it be a, a bullying case, uh, a possible fight, possible drugs on campus, uh, an issue with one student over another, an issue, a complaint regarding a, a staff member, us as, as administrators, it is our job to make sure that we handle it accordingly, we handle it in, in a timely manner, and we see that it is handled as soon as possible and rectified as well. Uh, communication. Mrs. Jimenez, Mrs. Bonillas, and I put a lot of stress on communication. Everything that goes on at Nogales High School that we experience individually, eventually we will, we will tell each other about it. Uh, no matter how busy our schedule is, no matter how hectic the day was, we always set, a, set some time aside to talk to one another, to uh, inform each other about what we, what we did that day. And this could be at a, a 6 o'clock a.m. meeting at IHOP on a Friday morning. It could be at the checkpoint at 2.05 after school as we by to the, as we, as we weave by to the students. Uh, we're talking, we're discussing, we're sharing. We're making sure that we're all on the same page and that we're trying to get the job done and we're trying to create a safe learning environment for all of our students. Okay. I'd like to pass the floor now to Mrs. Bonias. Good evening, I will be speaking about the investigation and the follow-up portion of our presentation. Once we receive, as Mr. Miranda stated, whether it be an anonymous tip, like Mr. Parra said, or any information, our eyes and ears are always open. We make it our number one priority to be out on campus. And so once we receive any information with any incident, uh, whether it's reported to us through a parent, through a student, through our teachers, that becomes our number one priority. Yes, we have many things that we need to do in order to strive for academic achievement, but the, this is number one. Uh, with the assistance of the NHS security team, we pinpoint the individuals who are either involved, who are said to be involved in a potential incident, and we speak to these students personally. Now this is extremely important because we need to know who the students are that are involved. We don't want to bring in a large number of students. And the only way we can do that as an administration is to be out on campus. We need to know where, the, where kids hang out, where they eat lunch, what it is they like to do after school, where they hang out before school, because then we can pick up on their tendencies. That's the only way that we know, well, maybe this individual doesn't really hang out with this one or something odd is going on. With a campus as large as ours, we need as many eyes and ears and po as, as possible, and as we learned as administrators, that's not going to happen inside of our offices. We need to be proactive and be outside. So once we receive the information, um, we need to be meticulous as to who we speak to. We don't want to get individuals involved who are not supposed to be involved. Uh, we need to just include the students with whom the report comes, as with Mr. Parra stated. We need to just target certain individuals that, whether it be a bullying case, narcotics, or a potential fight, you know, we follow up on the information that's received. At the same time, we report the incident to the school resource officer. Our lines of communication between the five of us, and I say five because I include our athletic director and the school resource officer, are always open. Everyone needs to know exactly what's going on so there are no surprises. So if they pick up on a certain piece of information that may be missing to our puzzle, then all of us are aware. And as a team, we can work with our NHS security team and then we can conclude uh, the investigation and only work with those students who we need to. Uh, it is important that we deal with the situation immediately as Mr. Miranda stated. And so our follow-up is once the investigation process is concluded, we call the parents immediately. We make it our number one goal at Nogales High School to contact parents of any student who we see in our offices. Whether it be for a good thing or a bad thing, we need to contact parents or guardians immediately. 
Unfortunately, we don't always have that option with phones being disconnected, but it does not matter what time of the day we leave our offices. It is our goal, and we strive to do this as timely as possible, to have a parent come in and meet with us. Uh, it is our priority to let parents know when students are in our office, especially when you know, we are imposing discipline. And so I will move on to the imposing discipline portion of the presentation. If at any time as administrators we do need to impose discipline for the violation of school rules, we call parents and we meet with them personally. A phone call is not going to explain what the investigation brought up, what the situation was. It is extremely important that they come in and that we meet with them personally and go over the referral process. We do impose the appropriate referrals as per the NUSD board approved discipline matrices and we review that with them as well. It has been the communication with the parents has opened up a lot of information at the same time because parents will come in, we call them and they're very quick to come to our, to our offices and then they say, well, you know what, this and this was going on. And so they're usually our number one source for more information and that assists us in being proactive and concluding any other portions of the investigation and follow-up process that we need to. After meeting with the parents, if needed, we do refer the case to our SRO and he will be discussing um, the process that he takes after meeting with the administration. So without further ado, Mr. Rey de la Osa. Okay, good afternoon. After the, all the assistant principal said and the principal, the, if there's any case that it has to be referred to me, It'll probably be a criminal matter. That's where I come in. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the Happy Hill fight first. Uh, on that uh, occasion, uh, we were notified by a concerned parent of the fight going on up there, and uh, we took it upon ourselves to go up there, uh, requested uh, additional help from other officers, and we were able actually to get there after the fight was over. But we set up a little roadblock since there's only one road coming down, and we were able to question students and find out who was the fight, who got into a fight and all that. It's not the first time this happens. Happy Hill is not the only place where students will get together and fight through several places around town. Uh, and and uh, if we get any kind of information about there is going to be a fight after school, we try to follow students because they, they actually uh, tell us right away when there's going to be a fight when you get a truck with about five or six students or a small car packed with students that are all headed the, the same direction. We try to follow them, try to avoid from then getting into a fight. Sometimes we get there a little too late and they already got into a fight, but we're able to get information on who got into a fight and, and investigate the incident from there. Uh, and the other uh, things that I do as a school resource officer bef besides doing traffic control in the mornings and in the afternoons, uh, every case that has uh, criminal activity is referred to me and not all just criminal activities. There's just going to be a fight on campus. We find out about it. We see a couple of kids arguing. We get information there's going to be a fight. We bring them up to the office right away. We talk to them. Administration talks to them. I let them know what happens if they get into a fight, what possible charges they can be looking at, and the consequences, and the parents are advised of that. If there is a fight, which I believe we had about three fights this year, uh, automatically, besides doing the school discipline, uh, I do. My report, uh, students are charged with disorderly conduct. They're also charged with assault. Uh, if there's a aggravated assault, we'll go with the aggravated assault. And my report is referred to the juvenile authorities or the county attorneys. Uh, we also have other incidents that happen at the school. Uh, every student, most every student is either carrying phones or iPods. And, and if you've ever been to a school, you see the backpacks are all over the place, especially during lunch. We have several incidents in where there's thefts iPhones, uh, phones get reported, we do reports on that. If we have a suspect, we will act on the suspect. If charges need to be filed, we will file charges if we get a suspect on a theft. On bullying cases, I'm brought in to talk to the students of if it's going to go a little step further on, on uh, writing up a report, because there is actually parents that want, want documentation from a police officer under bullying cases. If that's what they want, we will, we will do police, police report on that. Okay, if we have any kinds of threats, uh, any messaging on Facebook, whatever, we deal with that right away. Call in the parents, and if I need to file a police report, I'll file a police report. Okay, and a little bit on the drugs. Uh, they talk most of it about drugs. What I try to do in drugs so we can help out is we bring in our canines quite often. 
Uh, I get together with administration. We set up a date. Nobody knows about it. We try to keep it quiet until the day the, the canines are brought in. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had six canines come in at the same time. We did multiple rooms. We did the parking lot. We did the tennis courts. We did the uh, gym lockers. Every room was done at the same time. So we were able to hit about 30 rooms in one hour, which, is what, which was one period. And that turned out pretty good. We don't do that all the time, but we try to do it more. We, we do checkpoints in the morning where the students are coming in. We have a canine that, uh, that'll be at the checkpoint, checking vehicles coming in, okay? We also have a canine that is a weapons uh, canine. We bring that, uh, that canine also to check lockers, to check vehicles and all that, so that's pretty good there. If uh, we need, we also do canine searches on, as a matter of fact, we're just talking to Mr. Colgate right now, on the buses that are going out of town. We have the students put all their luggage in the bus. We bring in the canine without anybody knowing. Before they're going to leave campus, we have the canines go through the bus, go through our luggage. Uh, we, uh, if I need additional officers at, on campus, uh, especially, for example, on Friday we have the spring fling, I will call additional officers. They work real good with me. They'll send the patrol officers. They'll send bike patrol or our motor officers to help me out. And lunchtime, we're always out there. If we need additional officers, you make a phone call. If they're available, they'll show up for uh, to help us out, just to uh, wander around campus and all that. Okay? Uh, that's about it, anybody, unless anybody has any questions. We'll get to the questions. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so what do we have coming up uh, at Nogales High School? Uh, we met with Mr. Uh, George Silva, county attorney, last week and uh, Sergeant Villanes, and they will be doing a presentation on drug awareness uh, March 26th to the 30th. They, they will be four days at Nogales High School providing information to all, um, all um, student population. We're going to do this by uh, classes, by cohorts, uh, and it will be a uh, one-period assembly. Just like Mr. Prado was talking about it, uh, we, we're going to have the district is putting up a safety symposium in April. In May, we ha we're going to have Nogales Police Department and, and, and Chief Kirkham provide a presentation on safe graduation celebration, and this is something that we do every year. And, and, and last but not least, we, are, we already have plans for August and uh, from the Office of the Attorney General Department of Outreach, Community, and Education. Um, along with County Attorney Mr. George Silva and Sergeant Villanes, they will be doing a presentation on parent, to the parents and the students on cyberbullying and sexting. Um, just to conclude my presentation, I have uh, this, the perspective from a student, and this is our, our student body president, Mr. Aaron Huerta. Thank you, Ms. Jimenez, and thank you to the board. Um, like Ms. Jimenez said, my name is Aaron Watka, and I serve as the student body president. And what that entails is virtually serving as the president of the student council that oversees 20 plus clubs, five student organizations, and three honor societies. I'm here to collaborate with the administration on the issues that have been presented in the media about Happy Hill, drug violence, and, and fights that go on outside of school. It's like Mr. Parra said, not to dispel or deny that these incidents happen. They do. But what I would like to take, well, have the board take note of is that there are great things that happen within the school and that our students are doing all the time. An example would be the freshman orientation, that the student body comes together with the administration, student volunteers, and teachers to, pr to plan a welcoming seminar for the incoming freshman class. We offer campus tours, a club rush where clubs come together to talk about the opportunities and activities at Nogales High School, and we just virtually welcome the students to the high school. We have the spring fling, like, doc, uh, like Officer De La Rosa said, that we work with administration and we work with the student council to plan an activity during school hours that's safe, clean, and fun that students can participate in. It's during the sixth period. We have clubs submit a request to host an activity. The activities are submitted to Mr. Colgate for approval to make sure that everything's in working order. And it's an opportunity for students to enjoy themselves. Now, I understand that, that incidents do happen. And the overall message of what I want to speak to you guys about is that there are good activities going on at the high school during school hours. Um, 
we have superb academics. We have students soaring to new heights, especially as a senior. I see my fellow classmates getting their college acceptances and scholarship notifications within this month. And as a student body president, also a student, I just wanted to conclude and say that students at Nogales High School are safe. And to the parents and to the community and to everybody out there that's wondering, you know, the reports that happen in the media or on the radio and whatnot, it's, it's not a denial process that we're, we're having here. It's to let you know that during school hours, your, your child's academic learning environment and their environment to perform their extracurricular activities are not disturbed. And in fact, we see them having tremendous success from August to May. So that's the message I just wanted to relay to you. I have had a great year and I see other students across the spectrum having a great year and I don't see where incidents in the future will disturb in the slightest any of the students' academic performance, their AIMS results, or their, their achievements in sports or extracurricular activities. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And that concludes our presentation. If anybody has any questions. Marcy, why don't you start? <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to clear, well, first of all, uh, Mr. Wilkup, thank you, thank you for your words. They were very insightful and enlightening. Thank you. It's nice to get a student perspective from that. It was very nice. I just wanted, your presentation on the slide here referred to a Sergeant Vianes, but he's not a police officer. No, he's working with the U.S. US uh, National Guard. And uh, he was actually, he's working uh, through the office of Superintendent uh, Velasquez. And Mr. Pada sent all the principals the information, his information, and said if, if he was available to everyone at the district and see if um, we wanted any, any uh, reach out programs. And uh, Sergeant Villanes, he met with uh, Mr. Miranda and we were discussing about uh, different alternatives to suspension programs, and he's got he's he's young and he's very uh, passionate about about his work and and also about providing uh, students at in Nogales with the Nogales community with with different opportunities and and prevention programs. Uh, he also came along with uh, County Attorney Mr. George Silva last week. We met with with Mr. Silva and also Sergeant Villanes at the high school because they're, they're also working together to, to bring these presentations. And Sergeant Villanes is a graduate of Nogales High School. Yes, class of 2000. Okay. Uh, the school resource officer, are, are, you, are, you cor are you coordinating anything? Uh, the, the Nogales Police Department has a, an anonymous call in line. Are you coordinating or giving that information to the students and the parents of the district, uh, district-wide, to make sure that those parents have an independent agency that they can drop an anonymous call to and there's going to be guaranteed follow-up to it? When that system came up, uh, a couple of years ago it actually came up, we went ahead and passed out uh, bro a little card saying, uh, the information, where they can call, how they can call, and that was distributed when it came out about a year and a half ago, I believe they started the program. Okay, we can redo it again, but yes, we try to put it out as much as possible so the students and or the parents would know about it. I just think, Mrs. Jimenez and Mr. Pada, um, that that should be something that, that you do at the beginning of every year to tell the students because a year and a half, but there's a lot of new students or parents that come on in that may not be aware of that. Is there anything, Mrs. Jimenez, that we can do to help you in making the discipline matrix tighten it up or, or something? Do you have any recommendations? I, I don't need an in-depth response from you. Just, you know, is there anything that we can do in that area to help you in the policy? Well, and last year, uh Mr. McCall and Mr. Zimmerman gave us the opportunity to work on the matrix. So uh, Mr. Pada, Ms. Bonillas, and myself, we, we worked last summer, not this past summer, two summers ago, and, 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 and to making sure that we were able to modify, because it was either, um, sometimes it didn't give us enough 
to work with. And and uh, right now, the way it is set up and the way we worked and, and revised it and the board approved it, it's, it's working pretty good uh, with us. And also, Dr. Rodona, just uh, going back two years, I, I did, uh, you weren't part of the board. I did uh, reach out to the board and asked um, to help us uh, to work with the matrixes as well and also to make sure that we were consistent with the issues that have been discussed today and for them to be supported as a board when, when this came up. And I think we've had a very good consistency. Uh, we've been able to make uh, modifications and also use our alternative placement, alternative setting to work with most of these students. Uh, so that was something that came about with the discussion with the governing board. And back since two, two years ago, I can recall, uh, it's been working very well. And, and as I stated earlier, the, the process, the due process, everything is in place. And that's why you haven't seen anything come before you. Not that you won't, but at least the due process is in place. And it's going back to the discussion we had two years ago. Mr. Parra, since this incident uh, came to light and everything, how has been the district's relationship with the Santa Cruz County Attorney's Office? It's uh, it's, it's it's always been good. Uh, it's been it's been going well. I know uh, Mr. Zimmerman has communicated with him. Uh, I have communicated with him as well. Hey, he's met with the high school administration. Uh, as I told him, I think we're we're all going in the same direction. Uh, what has come about uh, since then is sometimes uh, during the hearings, parents have had concerns as to the court system and, and the hearing process for the schools. So I really have to kind of educate them because sometimes they come in and say that the cases, uh, individual cases have been dropped and they feel that we are putting a consequence and uh, when the cases have been dropped and the school is still falling through. So we explain that process and uh, other than that I think our communication has has gone well um, I've personally met with uh, Mr. Silva I also wrote him an email explaining uh, some of the things that had brought up by him and and uh, other than that I don't know if Mr. Simon wants to add anything but it's been it's been going well thank you and a comment on this letter that that you send out or are going to send out uh, I really like the context of, of the letter itself Thank you. And Mrs. Uh, Jimenez, it seems like you have a very good administrative team put together. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Yeah, I have a, a couple of things. Um, first, I would comment and say that I've witnessed firsthand the, the high school and the middle school's effort to control drugs. Uh, I know that you all take it very seriously. Uh, the matrix shift uh, was board uh, driven because we did want to give you the, the flexibility to to do the things that you needed to do in a consistent manner, as Mr. Pada has said, and, 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 and still be fair to everyone involved. And, and I think that you are uh, doing a very good job in that regard. Um, there's one thing I am concerned about, though, is I, I think this thing is, is because the the discussion item is Happy Hill in this report, I think there's a bit of a mischaracterization occurring here, and, and I'd, I'd like to try and address that a little bit because uh, I'd never want to send the wrong message about our concern about our students and our kids and their, and their behavior. But by the same token, um, if there are incidents occurring after school on private property, we have to be a little bit careful as a district. I don't think we need uh, or should turn ourselves as a district into first responders uh, to uh, after school off campus incidences. We have to be careful in that regard. Uh, our legal responsibilities uh, we have to be careful with. Uh, we, we have to make sure that that's handed off to the proper authorities, that the Nogales Police Department becomes, becomes first responders. Um, we have to use every piece of information we have uh, and, and convey it and, and, and make it available to the police department when we think uh, our students' um, lives are, are endangered 
or might be endangered or, or we have a fight brewing. Um, but I think we have to be a little bit careful about policing our student lives after, after school. Uh, I don't think uh, that it's fair to characterize a district's obligation in that fashion. Uh, so I would only ask, and, and I, I'd like to get your comments about that, because, you know, we, we need to draw the line somewhere. Uh, I, I, I would worry about our ability to discipline a, a student um, when something off campus after school has occurred. Okay, so maybe it was five minutes after school. What if, what if it was ten minutes after school? What if it was not a half a mile, 0 0.8 miles away? It was 1.2 miles away. And it was not 30 minutes, it was 50 minutes after school. Where do you stop? Where do you stop and say, this isn't fair anymore uh, as a media or, or the public to look at us and say, why aren't you taking care of this? Well, come on now. There has to come a point where that's no longer our responsibility. And, and it's not fair to you guys, and it's not fair to us as a system to be saddled with that type of thing. <clears throat> Again, don't, I'm not, I don't want to send the wrong message and say we're not going to help in any possible way we can. But we, we can't be the local police department. We can't be the sheriff. Uh, we can't be the prosecutor and the county attorney. Uh, help me in understanding where and how, as a district, we can cut loose. And, and can we really discipline and do we discipline kids for off-campus stuff? Uh, and and uh, you've hit on the, I think to conclude our, our presentation and what we have discussed, uh, we thank you for that and for, and for understanding. And I think that our principals and, and, and our school uh, community has been dealing with this. Uh, you're right. Um, what was presented today is that we always make an effort because usually what happens on the weekends comes back on Mondays or sometimes just information from the parents calling and, and saying so we make the the best to make sure that we follow through. Um, what started and, and, and since you brought it up Mr. Aran is because uh, going back to the question that Mr. Barona had, this came out about uh, the county attorney making a statement like that and, and saying uh, shame on shame on the district and and I think that that's the misconception because on that particular email, I explained what we do as a district. Uh, we do have to be mindful of the privacy rights of students. We don't have the luxury, even if a student is 19 years old, we don't discuss student names. We don't bring it to the public. We don't discuss the issues at all, as it was said earlier today. But we appreciate your understanding of that because that's what we have been dealing with. And that is where part of the education will continue with our parents, informing them there is a point where they have to take over as parents. And yes, we are responsible for our students that come to our schools and to our district, but there is, there is a time and there is a place. Uh, and I don't want to send the wrong message that we're not being proactive, even if it's off campus. But exactly what you said is what we have been feeling, and we appreciate uh, that you are understanding of that as a board. And, and that was part also of our, the message that we wanted to, to convey today. And also, uh, also, I just want to add to that, that um, just like we presented and we say, if we find out that something is going to happen, we act on it. And, 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 and we try, just like, just like we said, if we see kids that are going, uh, in, in one direction, and if there's something that we can do to stop from happening, we're gonna do that. Uh, but it's but just like Mr. Pata said, we thank you for understanding, and and we have, um, and I'm just gonna really fast. Uh, we had an incident at the high school that we found out that a group of students they were gonna get into a fight. So we called the kids up and we talked to them and we say, you know what, this needs to stop, and we did everything that we do. Like a week or two weeks later, we find out that they got into a fight off campus and not at Happy Hill, I guess a place that they called um, Ghost House somewhere. I don't know. That's what the, the, the kids say. Well, the parents took the kid across the line for the, to get medical attention because they didn't want to go uh, 
through the, the, the hospital because they knew they were going to get a police report and that the school was going to get notified. So this is what we're dealing with. This is our situation. And, and, and yeah, we're going to be proactive and we're just going to make sure that we do whatever it takes on our end to, to, to be preventive. Just like Mr. Prada says, those problems come back on Monday. The kids fight uh, through Facebook on Saturday night, Monday, uh, Sunday morning, and it comes to the school. And Monday morning we have a police report with uh, a, a bullying or something that happened through Facebook. So, so it does, so just to make our job easier, we, we, we like to follow through and, and address anything that comes to our desk. And Mr. Arana, to answer your question, the school does not discipline them. Now, because we go into with our golf carts, it's just a preventive measure. It's not as a first responder uh, because we're not going to break up any fights. But uh, we do contact our SRO and know our students are not disciplined off campus. We know our responsibilities within the proximity of our campus. It makes sense. Like, you know, well, but like I say, where do you stop? And I know you're trying to do the absolute best you can. Uh, but I don't want the community to mischaracterize our, our responsibility here. I think you're doing what you're supposed to, and you, you have to somewhere be able to say, this is something that the police department has to take care of, and this is something that the sheriff's department has to take care of, and, and you're obviously aware of that. No, I have Mr. Chen. Thank you, Hector. I, uh, I echo your concerns. I was going to ask where, where legally, where where are our boundaries um, it's I, I find it a little disturbing when people expect <clears throat> uh, the school district to raise their child 24 hours a day and, and I, I definitely think uh, the parents need to take uh, responsibility for what happens to their children um, off the of school grounds after school hours and uh, uh, I could go on and on about that and probably maybe even get myself in trouble but uh, I'm, I will stop there but uh, thank you Hector for your sure. concerns and I echo those. Let me make one, one comment. Mr. Arana what you said needed to be said. Uh, I can put my hearing officer hat on. <clears throat> I can bring up a, a, a sort of a lot of perceptions. I have seen it firsthand where when you talk about first responders, when I got parents coming in saying that, what are we going to do about this sexting and this bullying that's taken online? When it took place, when you look at the dates, it takes place during Christmas break, and it always trickles over into the schools because we have become the caretaker. What you just said, Dr. Nash, needs to be said because I think far, out, far too often parents, many parents, want to put that blame on the schools. And people need to take responsibility. I have a, a son and a daughter. I'll make no mistake, uh, God willing, that they don't do something wrong, but they probably will because kids do wrong. Good people do bad things once in a while. Do they learn from them? And I saw uh, when this incident took place, I started to have flashbacks from what I was hearing from my first day on the job about things that are going on in Nogales. So I called in Mr. Parr, and I needed, to, I needed a, a, a reality check because, see, I'm not the type that goes through denial. I don't turn a blind eye. And when I hear that all of a sudden we did have several um, long-term suspensions coming down the pipe, and then we get it topped off with heroin, I start to get concerned because I want to make sure if we do anything, any effective schools, and we know the correlates, that we're going to have it safe and orderly. That kids shouldn't have to watch their back and being drugs being sold uh, all over the place. I think one of the things that I think I would respond if I was a board member to the question, what can you do, is that we need to be supportive and have insight and be mindful that I believe, Mr. Watka, that there are far, far, far too many things that are positive at that school to have the 5% of the negative things overshadow that. And I think that we... And, I, and, I, and that camera's right on me, and I'll tell you that parents need to step up and take responsibility for their kids. We will do our very best during the day and the time that we have them. The question is, are they going to do the same? And you've heard that cliche over and over and over, it takes a village to raise a child. It's not just the school's responsibility, but we will take our share of the responsibility. We know that there are drugs at the school. There is 
let's be straight up about it. We know it, and we'll do our very best to make sure that we get rid of those uh, types of behaviors that aren't what we want in our schools. And we can go all day. I think that uh, where, uh, where do we draw the line? You know, it trickles over in the school, and sometimes we just have to deal with it proactively the best we can. And I think uh, this type of discussion with parents, uh, they say it's a process, not an event. It needs to happen, and parents need to know uh, that they have to take care of their business. I've been in hearings. And I have seen parents who didn't have a clue what their kid was doing. 70 absences. He's 17 years old. That's three credit hours. He's doing this, that, this, and that. And I have to ask the parent, how disconnected are you not to know what your child is doing? I'll stop there. Um, but I think one of the things I've been trying to do for quite some time is to celebrate all the good things we do, too. And I believe with, with Mr. Coppola, he understands that we know that there are some things that need to be reported that aren't really good for us. But we also have some good things happening, too, and we want that message to be out there. We want it balanced. Okay, so we have some issues, but we do have some very good things, too. And just to add on to that, from a, an additional student's, student's perspective, I just want to let you all know that the student leaders, the student council leaders or club leaders are just students that set themselves at a higher standard all intercommunicate about these, these situations that happen at school and they work with the adults to notify about certain instances and that there is also a student leadership and, and I'm just talking about myself here, I'm talking about a vast majority of other students ranging from the freshman class to the senior class who do take ownership of these responsibilities, do set the example and do communicate with each other to make sure that they can also assist in the preventive measures that are going on with these Happy Hill or these, these, all these incidents that are happening. And my, my overall point of, of what I had notified you guys about earlier was just to make sure that, that the same amount of light is being shed on the numerous positive things than on a, a 80,000 or whatever the rumor was, drug bust of heroin that happened at Nogales High School. One student's action or misconduct does not reflect that of 1,700 students. We have students that attend Ivy League universities, students that are awarded with the Gates Millennium Scholarship, and we would like to see that focus more and more throughout the entire school year than uh, KLD News 13 spin on, on a drug bust. So that was just what I wanted to add to you guys. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for your presentation. The next item is titled um, Self-Opt Food Services. Let's be clear, because I know that we have Ed out there, and, and you know what we have to do in terms of our finances in this district is we have to take a look at everything. We're looking at transportation. We're taking a look at insurance here in the future. If I have insurance companies out there so they can deliver the same product and lock in a contract and give us what we need, then we have to be mindful to that. And it, there's, no, um, and there's no difference even with, with uh, food services. We have, uh, Carla's going to uh, steer this, but it's not so much whether or not we are moving towards that direction, but we want, we're trying to figure out which ways that we can service the kids effectively and efficiently at mealtime and get the most money out of that. And that's what this presentation is about. Thank you, Mr. Zimmerman. Mr. President, members of the board, uh, we are um, putting this presentation on here for you today. Just food for thought, just something that we've been thinking about. We recently had a, an audit of our food service program, and one of the auditors suggested that we look into the provision too. And you know, we're talking about doing good things for students. You know, there's been a lot of burdens placed on public schools. One of them is to feed children, and, and before we would only feed, you know, give lunch, and now it's breakfast, and now it's after school snacks. So, so again, where do we stop? Maybe we'll start serving dinners, you know, not too long from now. But the provision to presentation, I'd like to uh, have Mr. Uh, Eduardo Bañuelos do the presentation, talk a little bit about what provision two does, and uh, how uh, it would benefit our district, our students mostly, and, and we, we need some guidance from the governing board, some feedback as far as what direction you want to take. We want to be able to use uh, better baseline data to make a better decision about whether the, the provision two is, for, uh, is good for our district. So without uh, 
further ado, <laughs> heard that before. I'll hand it over to Mr. Bañuelos, and then I'll step in and out to, during the presentation. Thank Food you. for thought, you're punny. <laughs> 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 Members of the board, Superintendent Zerman, thank you for uh, letting me have the opportunity to talk to you about Preprovision 2. We are currently under one, where one is, explain a little bit to you guys, one, <coughs> due, due to the applications that are required by the state, certain percentage of kids eat for free if they qualify, reduce where they pay 40 cents, or they pay the full price depending, it's a different price from elementary, middle school, and high school where two will allow us to give every student in Nogales free breakfast, free lunch, and free snack. They will not have to pay no more. And it will give us an alternative meal, meal counting claiming option approved by the USDA. These are people telling us, you know, they tell us what we can serve them, how many ounces of protein, fiber, calories, and like I said before, it'll be no charge to students. The first year, there'll be a lot of paperwork. But after the first year, it's going to reduce the paperwork tremendously. That's going to save us on man hours, labor hours. Um, it'll simplify our meal counting and claiming procedures. You know, it takes us like two days to do our meal counting. Now it's going to probably take a couple hours. A little overview. The USDA requires that 85% of, of our students qualify for free and reduced. Nogales currently is at 89%, which I think would be a good direction for us to go to. Like I said, it reduces our paperwork. We will implement breakfast, lunch, snack. And this, for the first year, you are going to have those applications. Those applications that are always, you know, the principals. The lunch clerks are always struggling to get them in. But for, for this first year, we're going to have to get 100% in, or, or better than we did this year, in order to meet that percentage. And it's just going to simplify our meal counting. No more money, no more money exchanged from schools, no more bank deposits. I mean, it's going to save gas, like it's labor. And it's just is going to simplify our, our edit checks, which we do on a monthly basis. This program needs state approval. Unfortunately, that date is May 1st. So we gotta move kinda quickly on this. And we are targeting breakfast, lunch, and snack. And during this base year, like hopefully with more data, which we'll get in, in April, we could see if we wanna go forward with it or go back to the way we're doing it now, where we're charging the students that don't qualify for free reduce. And these percentages are based on a total application turn-in, where the more kids we have application turn-in for free, the better off the district is. Reduce, the better. Same as paid. That way we know what percentage, the, where the district will sit, what they can get back for reimbursement from the state. Unfortunately, though, if we do go in this direction, we will have another audit next year. We did fine this year. I have no doubt, so we'll pass it again. We flew, I mean, they found one thing, the rest of flying colors. Uh, one thing the auditor said was that the size of our district, it was the easiest audit she has ever done this year so far. So kudos to the employees, staff. And then our served meals, like I said, I keep on throwing this in, is no cost to students. From K to 12, there is no charge, no more money, nothing. It's going to speed up lines. And with the percentage that we get to claim the meals for the next three years, this one year, our base year, will be the percentage that we're going to get for our reimbursement for the next three. So if our enrollment drops, we still get the same amount of money. If the enrollment goes up, we get the same amount of money. So, Is it the right choice? 
There are some schools that are above 90% and there's some that are below 60. But it takes the average and our average is above, it's about 89%. It'll benefit the community, the district, and especially the children. I mean, it's free meals, free food. You know, it's, it's, so sometimes it's hard for my staff because we see the students that come in on Friday. Fridays are usually like to have pasta day because I know they didn't get very much protein starches. So we try to serve more pastas on Mondays. Same as Fridays, a lot more hamburgers so they get the more protein because we know sometimes they don't eat very well on the weekends. Where we are now, like I said, we are provision one. We kind of have a provision two outlook on this because breakfast is universal free for all students where all students can eat for free. Not all of them take advantage of it. We like, you know, we need more participation to get the students in. But the students that are eating are mostly the free students reduced and a couple paid students. Currently, out of those percentages of free and reduced students, 90% of them are eating breakfast. And for lunch, about 89%. All this data that I'm getting up to in the next couple pages is from October of last year. That's like the fiscal year for the USDA. That's what they tell us our reimbursement is based on, you know, counting. Last year's reimbursement was a little over $2 million, just in food service. So out of that $2 million, we pay employees, buy the food, feed the kids. How do we decide if we want to go provision two? I'm asking uh, the board if they'll allow us to, in the week of Ames in April, April 16th through the 20th, I believe, 21st. I would like to see if we get your approval to uh, implement this program for one week. I'm going to try to forecast if it's going to benefit the district or if it's going to hurt the district. I don't want to go forward with something that's going to hurt us. So if I could get K through 12, I know Ames at the elementaries only. Some middle school at the high school, there's no Ames that week. But we picked that week because we know elementary and middle schools, most of the students will show up for their Ames. At the high school, we're going to do it during Ames, but not all the students show up because some of them have to take the Ames, some don't. So we think that one base week will give us an average if it will benefit the district. How do we do this? I need board support. I need the help of uh, school counselors, principals, teachers, families, students, staff, food staff, food service staff. We really want to promote this. We really want to get out there and say, you know, from the, this week, this week you will receive free lunch, breakfast and lunch. Promote them both, as well as after school snack. So this will give you some more accurate numbers to forecast for the rest of the year. We also, if we go forward, we need to get 100% of applications in for next year. And I think we have a cutoff sometime in October, right, for the applications. In October 1st, I believe that's when they forecast your dollar reimbursement, which you will receive for the rest of the year. So we have kind of like a, a deadline in October to get all the applications in. I have a couple vendors already on board. The first year Southwest was here, we got some iPads and iPods, gas cards, prizes, you know, bikes from Walmart, just to help these, you know, help them. You turn in your application, put you in a raffle. So I got vendors on board ready to do this. We just need to know if we're going to go forward with it or go back. And going on this provision too. The USDA, I think, gives us a little more, about 150000 of free food. It's not free. You've got to pay for shipping. But it's all USDA products that are, you know, farmer surplus produce. It's all shipped to us. This provision, too, would also give us the opportunity to receive more commodity dollars. So it will give us more free food. And we know diabetics, diabetes. Obesity, you know, it's, it's very high here. And this will help us, you know, we know it's a healthy meal going out the door. 
it, it's you know we're not giving them sorry junk, but you know balanced meal for lunch, breakfast on lunch. And doing this, I feel it'll reduce our consumptions on Cheetos and Pepsi and you know all the sodas, all the sugary snacks that we see that some, some students bring them in. <laughs> what are our benefits? We know every child is going to eat. Hopefully, we get them to eat. The community get involved. In the next couple of years, those decreased paperwork, applications, verifications, labor. And my number one focus is the feeding the kids. Uh, that's what you guys pay me to do, so. I do my hardest to get them in, but sometimes it's kind of difficult. They just new menu ideas, trying to get them to eat. Um, next slide I have. Oh, you don't have it? Okay. This, this is, yeah, I did have it. This is a little chart we put together by school that shows you the, on the number of participating, those are the total number. This is based off the, off the total amount of applications received by school. This does not, I don't think all, there's only a couple of schools that are 100% on applications. Not all of them are 100%. But like A.J. Mitchell, for example, 89% of, of the students that are free are eligible. That's all we're serving are free. There's 11% there that we're missing. Same as reduced, 24% we're missing. And the eligible kids is 31% missing. You know, as you and challenge the same thing, not getting all 100. There's like 9% missing, 15 reduced, 20, was that 28 on the eligible? You know, it goes down the line if you want to look down. Elementaries aren't that bad. Is it blurry? <laughs> but when you get into middle schools and high schools, Wade Carpenter's at 67%, and that's the highest. We go down to you know the high schools are right around 50, same as Desert Shadows. So we're missing about half of our kids that are qualified for free and reduced. They're not eating. So that concludes my presentation. I want I want my focus is I want to get that other 50 percent. It'll it'll benefit you guys, benefit the kids. Another one of the benefits uh, that it was on the slide, there, there, there is no stigma of poverty associated with the child nutrition program if we would to go with provision two. The idea is that all the kids eat and then nobody knows you know, who's free, who's reduced. And you, you, know, you can see that trend in the upper grade levels when kids start you know, intimidating each other about you know, their financial status or their in their in their families and, and it's a shame to see that you know although the kids qualify for free and I'll, I'll pick at, uh, the, at the high school level only half of those kids that are eligible for free meals are eating in, in school and and I think I don't know if it has a lot to do with that stigma but this would be beneficial you know uh, overall for for everyone involved at this point, I think we'd like to see if there are entertaining questions, see uh, maybe we can get some direction whether you want to move forward and, and, you know, doing the trial run during AIMS testing to get a baseline data to see how our participation does during that week so we can make better financial projections for you to see if we, can, we should move forward with this. Uh, Marcy, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, does the application itself still ask the question of the parents, their income? Yes, it will. So a lot of, like you say, the problem that I have is you're not going to collect 100% because parents, there are parents that don't want to put their financial income in there. And if it's a requirement that you collect 100%, well, here it says, need to collect from 100% of the students at all schools. It says applications from 100%. That means to me that you're telling us you have to collect it from every student. Is that not accurate? 
Well, ideally, we'd like to, to get a true representation of, you know, of our demographics at each individual school. Now, it is very challenging, and I'm sure Ms. Mendoza can tell you some of the struggle she's had in collecting all the applications at Nogales High School. I think uh, we've collected all but 100 last time we checked. But it is <coughs> difficult because some parents do not want to fill out the application, and, and I don't know, for a var variety of reasons, maybe they feel that they don't qualify or some just don't want to provide that, that income information. But it'd be a shame to not qualify all our children that are entitled to free meals, even if we stay in provision one, and not take advantage of that at the school. Given the, the, the economy, you know, you would think that families would look for every opportunity to feed their children without burdening them. No, I, 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 I agree with your statement, Mrs. Soto, but I don't want to indulge on the parents and say, we have meals here, you have to do it. You know, that's a parental decision. Whether they want to fill the application, we are just talked about right now, it's the parent's responsibility, not our responsibility, okay? Uh, so this isn't accurate then. You don't need 100% of the students' applications at all schools then. Uh, no, we do not. It is not a requirement. As a matter of fact, uh, the child nutrition programs say that it is a voluntary process. As a district, we would like 100% turned in. So you're not, if you don't get 100% of the applications turned in for audit reasons or whatever, what is the percentage of increase financially that you have to make sure you increase over what you're doing right now? I think that the, our demographics are almost there. Like Mr. Manuelo said, 89% of our population qualify for free and reduced. The baseline for provision two is 85%. The key in, in having this be uh, a program that's going to be self-sustaining is to increase the participation of students in the program that are actually eating in the cafeteria. Not just eligibility, but also the participation is the biggest component because the more students that eat for free, for example, the bigger reimbursement we would get because it's all based on those percentages that you established during your base year. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I have concerns, some concerns here which I've surfaced here, but I don't have a problem with running a week as a test week and then coming back with statistical data to indicate all of these factors and make a more solid presentation. That I don't have a problem with, but there is some other concerns that I do have, but I would, I would wait to see what happens because that week might say, hey, we can't do it. So I'll just, I don't have a problem with going ahead with a week trial. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if you don't need a, as Marcy's talking about, you don't need a minimum participation amount, you, you just want to increase the people that are filling in the forms and applying and eating the meals. I guess I don't understand what's the downside. The, the downside is uh, the way the way ADE has it, the free and reduced kids, the reimbursement from them is going to, that's, that's going to cover <laughs> the kids that are, gonna be, that are full pay that are eating for free. So that's why we have to try to get our applications up. We know it's, it's not obligated to do it, but we're almost there. I mean, if we could increase the, by 10%, this, the food service would be self-sustaining. You want self-sustaining. Self What's the downside? If you don't make that, you lose money. How much? I knew you were going to ask that. Yeah, we did a school by school analysis of the month of October 2011 and the idea here is that you know whatever monies you generate from the pre uh, meals that have been provided each uh, free meal we receive two dollars and seventy nine cents I believe and for every paid meal we receive 20 28 cents Do I have that right 
So the idea is to increase the participation. I, I think that maybe we've got a little bit confused there, but the, the applications, it'd be wonderful to get 100% of them in, but the key is to increase that participation. Now, in the elementary, we have no problems there. Every school would make money with the exception of one that, you know, the socioeconomic status at that school is a little bit lower. But at the upper grade levels, we'd be losing money. And, you know, again, we're going to pick on the largest school, but Nogales High School, as it is, we would lose $200,000 if the participation remained at 52%. And we and went that's on just this program. And if we went on this program. Now, if the participation at Nogales High School went up to 60% or 65% or 70%, then they'd be self-sustaining on their own. But the idea is that every school would be self-sustaining and not have to carry you know, and other schools because their participation is so low. Okay, that's all I had. Sure. I was going to say on your slide up there, like Nogales High School says 52%, if you go back there, what do you need that number to be? At least 60. If we get that to 60 and then reduce kids up to about 40, 42%, it'll be self sustaining. Okay, so. I mean, there, there's, there's, we're look also looking, if we go this direction, getting rid of a la carte, a la carte is where a kid go buy, you know, a bag of chips, a Gatorade. They'll still be able to, to purchase those, but if we could claim one as a reimbursement, you guys would get back the 279 instead of the dollar. So if you include, like, Gatorades, waters with the meals, we could also see those numbers go but it's, it's kind of hard to say because we haven't, no gas I think never went provision to. You know, uh, to me, the, the one slide that you had up there and, and you're hitting on it now is the issue of competing. I don't know about you, when I was in school, if I could, comp if there was another, let's say there was a club and they were selling nachos. I might go do the nachos and not partake in your, your meals. And by eliminating that, do you think you get it up 12%? Yes. It will eliminate, but then we also looked at directions to help them out because we know their, their only fundraising is during lunch. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's, we could have them help do us the grill outside, something they could get a percentage of sales from that. I mean, there's other options besides just taking it all the way. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword because yeah. I've, I've been a student council sponsor. I know how important it was to do the fundraising. I know it's very important at NHS. Um, so, you know, something to think about because uh, there's pros and cons to, to, to both. Yeah, and if two, we have a district up north, SFE does, that does provision to. They see, I asked them that question, and they said that the students still eat because they know they don't have to pay for it. So they know that $2 that they brought to school, they could still have a meal and, go and then go something. participate. Okay. okay. And, and just one last item for information, uh, the anticipated cost uh, for that week from April 16th to the 20th will be about $5,000. Okay? Monies that we would not be collecting from the students that qualify for paid meals and reduced at 40 cents they have to pay. And this is just ba a projection that we've done so that you know exactly how much this would cost just as a trial run as so that it would give us good data to be able to make the recommendations. It's a good investment. Okay. Thank you, Ed. This. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move that we allow the uh, district to do the one week trial well, on I, the meals? I don't know if that we can vote on no, this yeah, item because it's discussion. It's but but discussion. I think that you said you want to do it on the 16th of April. Um, we have a governing board meeting on the 16th. Um, I, I can certainly put that on there. But then I'm thinking, I'm thinking that perhaps I, I don't know if that requires a board action. I thought that the presentation meant that you wanted feedback from us and you were going to set the direction. Yes, I, I, I would 
go ahead and move forward with yeah. the. If this were an action item, that's <laughs> how I would move. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was just, it's more to generate feedback, yeah, and right. then we would just move forward. The, this next item is the item I've been waiting for all night. Um, what we're, we're wanting to do with the governing board is to to also get some feedback because we are getting ready to uh, start putting contracts together. We are starting to take a look at what we know today. Not a grand slam, maybe not even a home run, but it is very close. And I think the administration should probably move up so you can pay attention to these slides because what you're going to see is you're going to see what we know coupled with the fact that I have some principals out there that could even make this a little harder for us because they're putting in personnel requests. And what we know today is what Carla is going to cover. And then at the end of this discussion, I'm real curious because last year, and I, I want you all to remember this, last year the governing board had a desire to have a carry forward of over a million dollars. I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this because it could very well, um, uh, we could very well do that, but it will uh, require some further reductions in the way that we do business. So let's just go through this, but be mindful that at the end you're going to see an amount of money up there and it's not going to be a million dollars. Okay. Well, we prepared uh, information for you today, what I, what I know as of last last week because I understand that Department of Education posted their uh, average daily membership numbers today that I have not had an oppor opportunity to review at this point. But uh, what we know now, um, Mr. Zimmerman provided in your packets a legislative update and um, the Senate the, and the House appropriations committees have passed several budget bills that, uh, that pertain to uh, financing for education. The major bills uh, that I have here on this on the next slide. Our House Bill 2858 and Senate Bill 1529. Yep. What we know now is that the base level will be the same as this year and again that's four years in a row that there will be no base level increase to the funding formula for education. The transportation amount per mile will increase by 1.7 percent per mile. Uh, Proposition 301 was passed uh, several years ago and that guaranteed a 2 percent increase in financing for education. Well they found a loophole because the increase would be on the base level or other components of the base level. So transportation is one of those other components. So we've been getting an increase on transportation, however, not on the base level formula funding. Capital outlay revenue limit, the funding formula will again be reduced by approximately $99 million. This year, the, uh, the coral funding was reduced by 63.9 million with an additional 35 million one-time reduction because of edu jobs. So we're getting money from one pocket and putting it into another. You know, we got edu jobs funding, but then our capital outlay was cut as well. And then the one-time 35 million cut is eliminated, but 30 million of this year's cap soft capital cut has been moved to capital outlay. This year's capital outlay was cut 47%. The next item here is soft capital formula. And soft capital this year was reduced by 100%. So we received no soft capital funding, no new funding. The monies in our budget now are carryover from last year. And again, we expect that the funding uh, formula for soft capital will again be eliminated. And, and again, uh, we don't see any increase there. And I just thought it was important to just leave on here food for, food for thought again, Mr. Hrana, is that the current provision for JTED funding at 91% would continue. The governor's proposal would increase the coral by 75 million 
and soft capital by 200 million. But again, we don't know, you know what's gonna happen. But uh, if, again, it, it seems like she is supporting education and, and she's willing to um, make those adjustments if she has to. On the next slide, again, uh, we don't have any update on, on the classroom site fund, also known as Prop 301. This was started in fiscal year 2002. The highest year was back in 2008 at $397 per weighted student. The district uh, for many years were allowed to spend up to the estimate. However, the estimates were set high and there was a cumulative shortfall as of fiscal year 10 of $195. So the state had to adjust the shortfall in the, the last two fiscal years, including this one. And the allocation was reduced to $120 Per, per weighted count each year. The new rate must be set by the Joint Legislative Budget Committee by March 31st. So we don't have a number from them. So we are not able to make any calculations because this new rate and carryover from this year would be used to calculate Prop 301 payments to teachers, which includes performance pay. The next couple slides have to do with Arizona State Retirement System contributions. This one impacts this fiscal year. House Bill 2264 changes the current split where employees were paying 53% or are paying 53% and the employer is paying 47% back to a 50-50 split. The 53-47 split was ruled unconstitutional in the re recent court hearing. House Bill 2264 makes the change retroactive to July 1st of 2011, at the beginning of this fiscal year. The excess contributions would have to be returned to the employees by September 30, 2012 as taxable wages in calendar year 2012. The estimate is about 144,000 district-wide. This would restore budget capacity to districts be, as there would be no savings incurred. And the reason I put this on there is that the state, as part of their budget balancing, reduced 41 million of school budgets due to the savings that they incurred by going to a 53-47 split versus the 50-50. The district would have to return that $144,000 or have its budget reduced and state aid reduced by $144,000. So either we give it back to the state or we give it back to the employees. House Bill 2264, and, and this again, I, I, I don't know the update uh, as of today, but last week it passed the House by a vote of 60 to zero on March 5th, and the bill still needs to pass the Senate be, be signed by the governor. For fiscal year 2012, and again, I, I put this slide on here because there's a misconception as far as how much of employer employee contributions are being made at this time. It, it is not an additional 3%, and the, and the way uh, I, I try to calculate this on, on this slide for you, is that the total retirement rate that is set each year is a cumulative rate of contributions from both the employee and the employer. So the total rate was 21.49%. 53% of 21.49 for the employee is 11.39%. At 50% would have been 10.75%. The employer at 47% was set at 10.10, .10, that's where we had the savings, and at 50% would be an equal split with the employee of 10.75%. So the employee difference is only 0.65%, and this year you approved a salary increase of 1% to offset the increase for retirement contributions. If House Bill 2264 passes, the refund for the employees would be $6.50 per every $1,000 of taxable retirement wages. Any questions so far? Okay. For fiscal year 2013, the total retirement rate is increased 
As you can see this year, it's at 21.49%. It's going up to 22.3%. And the 50-50 split will obviously be in place then. So the employee and employer will each contribute 11.15% towards the rate. <coughs> the total cost to the district for both the refund and the increase is approximately $236,000. Okay, the next one oops, is on the alternate contribution rate, also known as ACR. The Arizona legislature passed a bill last session that requires the ASRS to administer an ACR, alternate contribution rate, to participating employers that employ ASRS retirees who return to work. So this uh, would begin for fiscal year 2012-13 and the ACR will be 8.64%. And th this rate will be applied to the compensation, gross salary, or contract fee of an ASRS retiree who returns to work for an uh, ASRS employer in any capacity and for any number of hours, including substitute teachers. This includes payments made to direct hires, employees of a leasing company, and independent contractors, respectively. The estimated cost to the district is $105,000 at the current wages for the retirees. Now, uh, I think they tried to capture everything that if, if we are going through a company like ESI or we're subcontracting anywhere else, you still have to pay this penalty fee. I, I see a question coming, Dr. Varela. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So now, these people who are retired and have come back from last year to this year, we're going to have to pay $105,000 more for them to come back? That is my estimate, yes. Oh, so right now we don't have to pay that, but now we're going to have to pay $105,000. Starting July 1, we will have to start paying this fee um, on a bi-weekly basis. So every payroll that we run, we would have to calculate the alternate contribution rate for those retired employees. Why does the, why, I don't know, why is the district and not the employee doing it? Well, and, and I don't have the exact wording here, uh, but it, you know, the ASRS expects the district to remit the alternate contribution rate. How districts go about you know, paying for that or financing that is up to each uh, local education to make that determination. But we, we are obligated to remit the fee to the retirement system. But not limited to not being able to go back to the employee for that percentage if we, if we desire to do so. Because we remit, but how we get the money is up to us. Right, correct. Now I have a clear understanding. Okay, well we can discuss how because otherwise I, I, it's not balanced for the rest of the employees here. Okay, thank you. Okay, some few future considerations in the budget. The one cent sales tax ends in fiscal year 2014. That would be a loss uh, statewide of $1 billion. The K-12 rollovers will continue, approximately $1 billion. And the suspended funding formulas will probably be become permanent cuts, totaling one billion dollars. And again, it includes full day kinder, building renewal, and your capital fund reductions that we mentioned previously. And then there will be increased costs to the state from an assessed value decline. As you know, property values have been declining for the last several years. And due to the state equalization formula, they have to make up the difference because their, their state equalization is based on individual districts' poverty rates. So if our um, primary says value goes down, we receive more state equalization dollars. There's also a perception of higher taxes because this also increases our local tax rate. Again, uh, the tax rate will probably go up but we're taxing on less value of property. 
so we would generate the same number of dollars. So again, this is hard to explain because the perception is always that if you increase your tax rate, people are going to pay more taxes. Well, that not, that's not necessarily so. We all know that most of our property values have declined. So even if we have a higher tax rate, we're probably going to end up paying equal or less taxes. Just a question, Mr. Chairman, here. On that one cent sales tax, is that the one that was for three years? Correct. I thought that ended in May of 2013. Because they've already taken out, I understand, petitions, but it ends in May of 2013. 13. I know that there's a uh, pending, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Zimmerman. I know that there's been a, a bill that's going to be introduced. In so I hear, I heard that this past week too, right. but I've, I checked today and it wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that too, but I, I haven't heard enough movement within the a certain political party there, but I've heard that people have gone to take out because the governor has made it very clear she will not support it beyond the three years. So I don't think there's going to be movement. But there has been people that take out the petition. But I'm almost sure it ends in May of 2013. And if it's in place for three years, the funding would be for 10, 11, 11, 12, and 12, 13. So then fiscal year 14, we would not have the one cent. And maybe, I think maybe I, I put it, worded it the wrong way. It would end at the end of fiscal year 13. But for fiscal year 14, we would not have the, the sales tax. So it's in place for one more year. Thank you, okay. Mrs. OK, so our budget forecast, and again, these numbers are based on our 40th day average daily members, membership, and it's subject to change. Again, uh, no base level increase. We have a declining enrollment. And at the 40th day, we were down 48 students. That's an impact of about $200,000. We have a declining group B count, which would be your special ed categories, about 10 students there, 62,000. A declining ELL, ADM, down 130 students, about 50,000. That also, also reduces our override limit, about $15,000. Teacher experience index, another 10,000 there. We are projecting to have a full budget balance carryover. And uh, the maximum we can carry over is about $1.1 million. We don't know the exact amount of the reduction of soft capital, unrestricted capital. And again, uh, we don't have a, an estimate for Prop 301. And I think uh, I'm going to let Ms. <coughs> Ms. Scott, can you, do you think you can? Now she's been coughing and it was, but I'm going to let her talk a little bit on this slide. Excuse all my coughing. I went to a conference in North Phoenix Thursday and Friday and I had to drive past ASU and ever since I've been coughing. <laughs> okay. Um, we've gotten quite a bit of information on grants the last couple of days and I do want to say we were at a Hall of Fame meeting today, and as we were there, we got an email that our Title I amendment has been approved for over $4 million. So as of today, Nogales Unified is bringing in $7,098,186.37 in grants. And the last time we were here was at $5 million. We brought in another $2 million. Um, while we were at that meeting, uh, we were told various messages, but it looks like our Title II, which is professional development, they asked us to budget 3.5% decrease. They said on Title I, it looks like it's going to be the same, but there was one comment in there that I quite didn't understand, and that, but this has happened to me before in grants, that about October or November, the entire state may cut all grants 9.5%. So for us to anticipate about a 9 to 10% drop in grants, which for us would be $700,000 based on this. Um, forest fees, there was an article in the paper that, and I talked to Alfredo about this, um, it looks like 
they're going to cut 140,000. What do we pay out of forest fees? Well, right now, we pay mostly our SRO, our school resource officers, Ray, who was up here, and another one that we pay out of that. And Alfredo said that he's going to cover all of that but one. So it looks like we can do okay with our forest fees. Um, we were at the conference, Angel and I, uh, there's no movement on NCLB. Angel, I, and Carla went to Washington, D.C. exactly one year ago, and we were told that it would be reauthorized by June or July. Well, it's a year later, and now the word is they don't think it's going to be reauthorized into a new election. But whatever is there, if it's not no child left behind, there'll be something. Uh, they're, tr they're calling it ESEA now, um, Elementary Secondary Education Act. That they're changing the acronym, but it would still be there. Um, we're looking at, Carla and I did an analysis of personnel. Right now, we're paying 49.6%, 49.6, not percent, 49.6 people out of grants. That 0 0.6 isn't a short person. It is, some, it is the fact that at the high school, we have a number of teachers that are teaching an Ames class. That's one period. And you add up those six Ames classes, and it comes out to 0 0.6. But think about that, almost 50 people in our district are paid from grants. Everything from my position, Angel's position, to half-day kinder, uh, technology, uh, technicians, uh, only one secretary out of that, but it, it runs the gamut from high-paid administrators to, uh, we pay two teachers at Nogales High School, a teacher at Carpenter, a teacher at Desert Shadows from grant funding. And if that went away, the, the schools would have to do the same that they're doing with two to three less people. Okay? But it looks like what we have talked about and we, we have talked about in our administrative leadership meetings is that personnel are going to come first. You know, we don't want to have to put 45 in a math class because we're cutting two math teachers. It would be better to cut supplies. It would be better to cut travel. Now, I do want to explain that some travel is mandatory. I know that that's been a huge issue with the board over two or three years, but the conference that Angel and I went to was mandatory. It was a Title I coordinators for the state, and you had to go, if not to that one, to another one, and that was the closest for us. Um, a lot of the travel that we used to do with state grant money, we're no longer doing. We're bringing the expert to us. So rather than send six people to a desert institute in the summer, uh, we might, Angel might arrange for someone to come do Common Core training here and train 40 who then in turn become tr teachers, of tr trainers of teachers. So we are using the money wisely and well. Are there any other questions on grant funding? Because that is a big portion of what we have available to us. I do want to say one last thing. Um, we have gotten the final analysis of the race to the top funding. If you had read about this in the paper and we got another breakdown at that conference Angel and I went to. The state of Arizona got 25 million. They had applied for 250 million at the first round. They missed the first round and now instead of getting 250 million, they're getting 25 million. The state takes exactly half of that okay, for their own purposes and for regional centers. That leaves 12.5 million for almost every other district in the state. Now that might sound like a lot of money, but for Nogales it breaks down to 134,000 split over three and a half years. Well, if you take 134,000 and divide it by 3.5, you can see that it's not significant enough to make a big difference. And so what the analysis that we decided at our district to do was to devote that to personal professional development on a one-to-one -one basis and then also cite personal or cite professional development to train teachers in you've heard the word tonight STEM which is science technology engineering and math 
the state has also ruled that all the race to the top money must m mean a commitment that every class, English, history, art, uses STEM as a vehicle to teach. And just to let you know what that means, when I was at one of my meetings, uh, I was an English teacher for 34 years, and we taught primarily fiction, poetry, that type of thing. The state is ruling that 50% of what an English teacher teaches must be technology-based, fact-based reading, because that's the type of reading kids do in the future. Okay, when they retire, at my age, you you know fire up your Kindle and you enjoy a nice novel, but for the majority of people, okay, they're not reading fiction in the workplace. They're reading technical journals and many of our kids are unprepared. So one of the things that we're gonna be looking at to do with our grant monies is to make that changeover to where there's more materials available for the middle school and the high schools, because they have very little. You know, I know at my, my own site as a senior teacher, I might have had a choice of 11 novels, of which I taught three or four, okay? Now, we might have 11 novels, but we might have 20 or 30 articles, magazines, newspapers that the kids will also read in order to prepare them for work beyond high school. Okay. Any questions or comments? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Scott. <coughs> Again, we're foreseeing a budget balance carryover in grant, in the grants area, and we would uh, anticipate using those carryover monies to maintain positions that are currently funding with the grant funds. Okay, so we are starting our budget proposal for fiscal year 2013 with all the numbers that we put uh, on the previous slides with the base level funding remaining the same, the ADM decrease, uh, the decreases in, all, in the other areas uh, for SPED and ELL. And as you can see, in the area of MNO, we're looking at a decrease at the 40th day of approximately $330,000. Again, we're, we can't make a projection on Prop 301, grant soft capital, unrestricted, because there's so many things that are still undetermined at this point. So these, these are our best guesses at this point. We have uh, highlighted the budget balance carryover because I know that was one of the priorities of the governing board last year, is to maintain a budget balance carryover to keep us uh, financially solvent through the next uh, fiscal year. Uh, some of the proposed budget changes that we've had in the past uh, have uh, included across the board salary increase. We have not put anything there at this point. Health insurance cost increase last year was 2.4%. We have not received a renewal for this year. Arizona State retirement increase, the 50-50 split and the ACR. Uh, we talked a little bit about that before and how much that would cost the district, approximately $236,000. An increase in liability insurance. Again, we don't know this is last year's amount. 4% was about 15,000. Transportation, we have a budget study session or a transportation study session set for March 29th and we'll have more information uh, once uh, we have more information provided by our, our uh, transportation company. Utilities, this one is always on the list. Utility cost increase, 4% uh, would be about $62,000. And again, we left some of the other items that we've had in, in the proposal for you, including uh, retirement incentives, new higher salary differentials, cutting uh, M&O overtime. We've done a lot of that. Last year, overtime was cut by 50%, and as well as travel on the maintenance and operations side. We also cut supplies, dues and fees, and miscellaneous across the board last year. Uh, we reduced health insurance coverage for administrators, classified uniform service. Um, we may need to look at reducing override expenditures because the uh, override uh, 
capacity has been reduced over the last several years. And again, maintaining uh, some of the positions that we are funding with grants uh, with those carryover monies. Okay, here uh, I left in, in this presentation the ADM to staff comparison that we've had uh, provided to you for over the years. Back in 1999-2000, our enrollment was at 6,040. It peaked in 2001 at 6,112. And the projection for next year, we're looking at about 5,520 5, students. And again, I, I'll finalize and, and this number once uh, I do review the 100-day data. But as you can see, in comparison to staff, uh, we were Back in 99-2000, we were at 519, and we peaked in 06-07 at 645, and now we're back down to 561. What I've done at the bottom is a, a ratio, an ADM to staff ratio, and the higher the ratio, the better that we're doing on a staff uh, to student ratio. And over the last several years, the ratio has been increasing slowly but we're back at 9.8 as we were back in 0203. Mr. Zimmerman asked me to put together a budget proposal history for the last four years. And I know this is hard to see, and there's a lot of information there. It did take a, a lot of time to gather the information, but uh, we're looking at uh, fiscal year 2008 nine all the way through the current year. And our total budget in 2008-2009 was $58 million. And we were employing about 640 employees. That year, we cut uh, about five positions in the budget. And we went down uh, to 09-10 to a budget of $55.5 million and our, our staff declined there as well. In 10-11, our budget was 54.4 million, and the full-time uh, staff was 593. And then fiscal year 11-12, which is the year that we're in now, we're a little bit shy of $50 million, and the staffing is 561. What's important to note is that, well, our, our budget has declined $8 million in the last four years. In, in the grants area, we were about seven and a half million back in 08, 09, and it peaked last year, $11.3 million with the ARA funding that we, we received, and now we're back down to about eight and a half million dollars. Some of the, the, the cuts that we made over the years, in 08, 09, there were actually not, that, not very many cuts. That was the last year that we saw an increase to the base support level. And we were able to give salary increases of 3% in 0809. And again, we had in health insurance uh, coverage for classified employees was increased that year where the district is, was pay, uh, paying 100% uh, of their employee only coverage. And like I stated before, we cut five positions that year. In 0910, a total of 25 positions were cut. <coughs> there were no salary increases given that year. And we also uh, reduced uh, salaries in classified and administrative areas by reducing the term of the contracts from 12 months to 11 and 11 and a half months. We reduced our substitute utilization. We also um, cut our hard to recruit addendum of $1,000. On a previous slide, I think you, um, we mentioned that we are providing through Title II funds a hard to recruit addendum in the, in the areas of science, math, and special ed. Is that correct? Did I get them right? And that, the $1,000 that we were giving at the time was a continuation of the 5000 for the second year and third year, and we were not able to sustain that anymore. We also reduced classified on-call utilization that year by $70,000. And then we also made drastic reductions in soft capital and capital allocations in the 09-10 year. 
And again, we also reduce training and travel supplies, postage costs, and allocations for vehicles. Last year in 1011, we cut a total of 32 positions. No salary increases were given. And we made uh, reductions in different areas of the budget as well. As, 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 uh, as well as cutting the positions. Last year we also call, uh, cut on-call utilization by $65,000. It was another major item in, in that budget year. For this year's budget proposal, we did authorize, or the governing board authorized a 1% increase in salaries, and that cost $257,000. There was a slight increase in health insurance, about $58,000. And again, all the other items, including utilities, um, there, there were in increases in, in utilities, transportation, and liability insurance. We cut 31 positions out of the budget for, for this fiscal year. We also restructured our substitute rate, and that was a 25% reduction of the substitute um, budget. We reduced Prop 301 pay funding for teachers because of the decline in Prop 301 funds. We again reduced classified overtime and classified on-call utilization in the maintenance area. We again reduced training and travel district-wide supplies. We reduced the utilization for radios and cell phones, health insurance coverage for administration, classified uniform service, and then we cut uh, the CTE programs uh, for cosmetology and law enforcement. So that's pretty much a recap of what we've done the last four years. So. <laughs> No, it's a lot of information, um, more than you probably wanted to hear, but Mr. Zimmerman? Yeah, I soon to, would like to forget all that. That was a very painful last three years, uh, but it had to be done. Uh, nobody likes to make those type of reductions, but uh, we take the cards that are dealt to us and, and do the best we can. And is that the end of the presentation? Yes, I, I didn't forward to the second page of the budget proposal, but you can see, like, for, for example, in 0910, we cut 25 position total cuts were about 3.1 million. For 1011, we cut 32 positions, about 1.4 million there. And then this year, 31 positions, 1.6 million was cut. And I think it's worth noting that even though the average isn't always the best indicator of what's going on, uh, especially for uh, middle school and high school because they're not self-contained, is that we are still at about a 24 to 1. I know that at some of the elementary that some of the individual grade levels are a little bit higher, but for the most part, the average is still about 24 to 1 with all those cuts. And um, one of the things that, that you didn't put up there because it's it, – we don't want to give any false hope because we know that in the audience we have some administrators that would like to to make some changes, uh, do some increasing in terms of personnel, uh, which is always which is always difficult because if we're losing 50 students, you may think as a board, well, if we lost 50, why can't we recoup uh, a couple teachers? If you've lost 50, why can't you cut two teachers? But it doesn't work that way because what we're finding out that those reductions of 50 isn't just at one school. They're a little bit at all the schools. Um, we haven't gotten to a point at many districts with what their answer has been is to close schools and, and consolidate and, and, and do it that way. We haven't been able, we haven't done that. We've been able to, I think, make some progress, uh, sometimes painful, but we do have uh, approximately five or maybe six position requests that we will be very, we will look at carefully. So I had asked before this presentation that you to, to, to be mindful of the carry forward that, that you have been uh, used to, that you have wanted to, to have in the past. Um, if it is the desire of the board to keep it over a million, 
we will have to go back to the drawing table. We will have to take a look at some, some further reductions. Um, so we, we just basically want to get a feel f for you, f from you, so. Any discussion, questions? Mr. Chairman, just a comment. Just First of all, Mr. Chairman, this is very good, and I'm glad you brought it out at this early time so we could just give you a little bit of feedback. I still ha have uh, a concern about those individuals that we gave that federal funding to extra, that we spread out that $500, but these individuals got a reduction in pay the previous year, and we still haven't brought them back up to where they lost that money. So they, they, we have a group that's always been left behind for the last two years. Um, the other thing is that I'm concerned about when you get the 100th day report, I'm not too sure, because I, I do remember Dr. Utney saying that we lost 267 students. And if Dr. Utney is correct in that statement, from what you're saying, 48 students, that means that there'll be a deeper cut in the budget. It won't. It, I don't think it'll be significantly different than the 50. Uh, I don't recall 250, and, and I meet with- It's in the minutes. The last five years. Yes. The last five years. That's right. Okay, Thank you, John. Years. And I yeah, think he but also we're, we're expecting that it won't be that much of a difference. We've been actually pretty close every year. Um, so we're, we're anticipating that. We think 50 is a solid number. I know it's not a home run, but we think it's pretty accurate. And I think he did also say in his presentation, these are hit counts on specific points in time versus the average daily membership is an average of the first 100 days of school. So the numbers are different than what, we, what he's looking at versus what I use to calculate the budget. I think we'll have to correct that in the minutes. But, and then the other thing is I, I firmly believe on the carryover even for next year because something could happen and then we would have nothing to protect ourselves with. So, and I think that's in. There is one thing that could happen. I think we know what the elephant in the room is, is the one cent sales tax. That's the elephant in the room. And if there's nothing that's gonna be done with that a year from now, you're very right. If there's nothing gonna be done, we will, we will be hit very hard here once again in Arizona. And just be mindful that even though we plan on a specific carryover during the course of the year, there are situations that come up. For example, that we don't hire the, a teacher in a classroom, that we put the, a sub in the classroom. There are some savings there. So just during the normal course of the year, the carryover may run between three to $400,000. So you don't want to have too much of a carryover and risk losing that budget capacity. So that's, uh, you know, always a, a risk that, that, you know, setting a, a very high carryover might put you over the limit because it is restricted to 4% of your revenue control limit. So Dr. Verona, as we move down the line, are you, do you have a, an idea of what your desired carry for would be? Are you thinking a million well, it, or? The 1.4 million or so was within that 4% capacity last year then, right? The, the 1.1 1 .1 1.1 million, 1 .1, yes. yes. Yes, but for example, if I end up this year with 1.3 million, okay. and I can only carry over 1.1 million, I lose 200,000 in my, in my budget. I cannot carry that over. So I must spend it in this year. So again, you know, just be mindful not setting over, you know, the carryover amount too high because during the course of the year, there are some savings and, and sometimes the schools don't spend their budgets. You know, they're trying to all to help us out too. So, so we just, just keep that in mind that maybe a, an ideal number that we want to look at is between seven hundred and fifty to eight hundred thousand dollars in this budget proposal. And then through the course of the year for next year, the carryover will increase because of those areas that we may not spend to the full budget line item. Mr. Superintendent, I don't want to have a carry. I want to have a carryover, okay, to protect the district. But I don't want to have a carrier that's going to penalize us, though, either. Okay. Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. Okay. Get to go from Hector the attorney to Hector the CPA. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, th this is the beginning of the process. Um, yes, I want to carry over two and seven fifty sounds about right. 
we don't want to be anywhere near risking losing money on a carryover. Um, but the board has also received a, a, a report recently from the Auditor General's office that our uh, administrative and support service costs are comparatively very high versus other districts. And I'm concerned about that. Um, I've asked um, the staff, the administrative staff, to uh, make me more informed about whether those numbers are accurate and whether they're really comparable and that the state has a valid point that, that we need to reassess in a, in a meaningful way our uh, administrative costs per student and our um, support service costs per student. Uh, it would seem that if we start needing to look at reductions, that would be a logical first place to look if they are in, if they're accurate. So that would be my comment about where to start. Is that where we need to finish? I'm not sure. We just need to see how it how the numbers all play out. Fifty students lost cer certainly shouldn't translate into losing a bunch of teachers. Um, so again, I think. The Auditor General is trying to tell us that that's where we need to start looking. Um, so Good point. And at the next board meeting in, in April, we will present that Auditor General's for the last five years and, and offer up explanations through. Uh, there's actually been some, um, some organizations that have come forward with their interpretation of that, uh, that document. Uh, so we'll gather that, and we will have a, a, a much, a much a solid presentation at the next meeting. That's all, Mr. Chair. Um, my only comment is I, you've been doing this now for three years or so, and you always seem to, to keep it together. I just want to say I appreciate the work of you and your staff, and in whatever cuts you've had to make, uh, keeping them at a minimum, and I know that you will continue to, to do that, so I appreciate that. I want the community to know the, the effort that you and your staff do to get the most out of the dwindling monies that we have. I have to give a lot of credit to the admin team. We sit and we, we talk about this all the time. Nobody wants to make cuts, but we all know that when we find out that we're losing kids, we're losing money from the legislature, that we have to do what we have to do. And though uh, many times an administrator could just be mad, I'm not getting my way, and, and not really want to do what they have to do, they have all understood that this is, you have to be altruistic when you're dealing with the budget. You cannot be positional about your one school, that we all have to do what we have to do. Uh, one, one other comment, um, Mr. Arana, is that we have had over uh, the, the last few years um, if you took a look at that big list that, that Carla just put up there, and I want to say it for the record that many of our cuts have come at the expense of the certified staff. Okay? There has been some reductions in terms of 12 to 11 months with classified. For the most part, uh, there has not been much of an attrition rate. We have not riffed. We have used the attrition rate almost all of the time to, to be able to to deal with this deficit and if we had to make recommendations today because you wanted a, a higher carry forward then I would have to make a recommendation I'm saying it for the good of the people who are watching this on TV and the people in the audience that we would have to take a look at what's going on amongst the uh, the classified as well it's not just the certificated and this document that she has on the board right now is exactly what the administrative team has agreed upon over the last three years so but they have done a very good job and I, th I thank them and I thank them again um, thank you Carla this next item is short and sweet two minutes Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Zimmerman, and members of the audience. Um, we have an information and discussion item here, what we're calling the Grow, Grow Your Own Teacher Program. And you are probably all familiar with the fact that we do have members 
our, um, of our employee groups, usually in the classified service, who wish to become teachers. And they undergo the process and they find themselves in a difficult position when they're completing their senior year of their college coursework. And part of the requirement as an undergrad to obtain your teaching certificate is to do a student teaching um, class or what we call a practicum. You see those often on the board agendas for approval. Um, through the years, we've done different things in trying to support those employees that have um, undergone these career changes, but we've never formally adopted anything as a, as a district to um, make, make something systemic and uh, make a policy decision as to how we're going to support these individuals. So through the years, as, as you can see, we've um, tried to be flexible with employees um, by allowing them flexible work schedules, sometimes allowing them to come in before their student teaching happens or after the student teaching um, is over, depending on what kinds of jobs we have available and needs we have in the district. We've also in, um, allowed some employees to continue with their health insurance. Right now we find ourselves in kind of a difficult situation this year because we have three employees that are paraprofessionals and that are undergoing student teaching um, classes currently this for this um, semester. So two of them are doing their student teaching in the classroom in which they're employed normally with the district. So we just wanted to bring this item up to the board and give you some ideas. Um, one of the program ideas that we have for our classified employees and we're saying that we would support this if employees had been with the district continuously for three years or more. And some of the ideas that we have is to make available an option to work outside of the student teaching requirement for up to four hours per day, continue their health insurance, um, and the employee would pay their portion if they have family coverage, and supplement their pay for up to their full schedule if they have eligible accruals. So these are some ideas that we're throwing out there. We'd like to formulate a policy if the board is interested in this kind of program. And at this time, we're just looking so for some board uh, feedback on this kind of program. Any questions, Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, this particular program, it might have a different label, but it's been in place since we've had it with Northern Arizona University when Mr. Clark started it way back when. And I'm very supportive of this. I just hope that you do something like this, growing your own for administrators and train administrators also though to give them the opportunity to get out into the sites because we're going to be losing a lot of our top capital administrators. So I think we need to start training our own and letting them feel what it is to be like. It would be nice to have a program like that. I am supportive of this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any comments? What I heard earlier is we can do this with federal money. That's even better. So you can't pass that up. That's true. Okay. Thanks. Moving on to the consent agenda. Approval of routine warrants, purchase orders, travel claims, employee leave, and transfer requests, and employee resignations. Any matter on the consent agenda will will be removed from the consent agenda and discussed as regular agenda items upon the request of any board member. A, approval of February 13, 2012 regular board meeting minutes. B, ratification of student activities, auxiliary operations vouchers. C, ratification of expense payroll vouchers. D, personnel agenda summary. E, volunteers for 2011-2012. S, Y, what is it? SY. School, year. school year, okay. Uh, addenda and temporary position for 2011 2012 school year. And G, long term substitute teacher rate for 2011 2012 school year. Chair will entertain a motion. Move to uh, accept the consent agenda as proposed. There a second. No, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to talk about number A and number G. Modify my motion, excluding A and G. Second. Okay. Discussion? Item A? No, all in favor? Oh, all in favor, yeah. Oh, it means so out, uh, other than A and, a and G. A and G, right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Sorry. Moving to item A. Discussion? 
Uh, the only thing there, Mr. Chairman, on the minutes, it says under the presentation of the 100-day comparison report, it said Dr. Rodney reported and explained the loss of 267 students. Dr. Rodney clarified right now that he meant there uh, for the past five years. So if we could just add uh, for the past five academic years. Okay. And that's all, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll make a motion to go ahead and accept the minutes of February the 13th. Uh, as presented and amended. Second. Okay. Any, any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Item G. Uh, under item G, if I I'm move that we oh. uh, go ahead. Uh, approve the long-term substitute teacher rate for 2011-12. Okay. So need a second. You can second. A second. Discussion. Under discussion, Mr. Chairman, here again, I think it's, if I recall right, it's a $5 an hour increase. Yes, Dr. Verona, that's correct. Um, we're proposing a new rate. Last spring, the rates were adjusted and they were no longer full day and half day rates. They were hourly rates. And as you can see in your item, they're spelled out. Um, the thing about the long-term substitute duties is that they're more extensive. The substitutes do have then to do um, additional duties, and they have to plan for the classes and do a lot more than um, a substitute that just comes in on a daily basis. And we thought that it would be um, a good idea to propose a $20 an hour rate for long-term subs, and that would be defined as those substitutes that are in the classroom for 20 consecutive days or longer. And my concern is, once again, that last April when we were talking about when we had a set daily fee, which I supported to having the set daily fee, if I recall right, Superintendent Zimmerman says, we can do it the, like we're recommending. Now you want to change it. And here again, we're going and changing things from what we said the last budget year and what we agreed during the budget. So. For that reason, I, I just can't support it. Okay. And ideally, it would be to our advantage not to have to use substitutes, but unfortunately, we don't have the highly qualified and properly certified pool of applicants that we'd like to have in our area. So as a result, we're forced to use long-term substitutes, and we feel that the rate is not competitive enough at the $15 an hour um, which is the top rate for our certificated teachers. So for example, most of our long-term substitutes are emergency and standard, which are at $1,275 an hour and $1,350 an hour. To take care of a classroom, have to plan lessons, have to input grades into power school and all of that seems not fair and not competitive. And it's just that's a need right. that we find ourselves having, and so that's why we're bringing this back to the board for reconsideration. I think the thing with the substitute rates may be also something that we have to work through and work on, and I don't see it as something that you are going to be able to um, just have this, you know, the rates that you established last spring and continue to be competitive and continue to pay people what they need to be paid. I think that it will have to be something that is a breathing and living document that we can come back to and propose maybe different rates for you in the future as our needs change or as monies become available. And also it's, it's a recommendation that came to us from the principals. I don't know if any of the principals would like to come and address this. Uh, this is in support of the principals for the individual long-term substitute only, which we only have a few in the district, about eight in, in, in the district. It also brings back the consistency. Uh, what we talked about the last time regarding substitute, it, it was the amount of pay that was given to the uh, substitute teacher who was retired. And in this case, we have long-term substitutes who have been there more than 20 days. And to keep the consistency, these uh, substitute teachers are also doing everything else the regular teachers are doing. And that's why the recommendation is just that adjustment with that group of, of, of teachers. Um, and again, that came from uh, administrators as something to review, to bring back, to discuss, and to bring back for, for your consideration. I was, I was the principal that requested it. For example, I have a seventh grade science teacher, and I, 
had his permission to mention his name tonight. Mr. Trujillo, he, he has a master's degree, but not in education, so um, he's in the classroom doing the regular work that all teachers do, um, but he's not compensated. So he has every period uh, anywhere from 40 to 52 students. And so we're having to uh, reduce his numbers, and um, I teach his fourth period, so I teach about 20 kids every day. And uh, I grade his papers, and I input him in power school because he's just overwhelmed. So is it, do I let him go and have a crisis in the middle of the, well, almost ending the school year, or do we increase his pay by a certain amount, uh, which is, for me, worth it? So do we, you know, we have to take a position, and I, and I have to, you know, think about the kids and uh, the part that uh, he told me, I'll, I'll go. I think that we need to compensate them accordingly. I, un I understand your point, Mrs. Montiel. And that's why last year when we were talking about it, I was in support that we should stay with the same salary that we had last year so that you could attract people. And I don't understand the statement that you're saying 42 students to 52 students. I thought the superintendent just said right now you were, we were 24 students per class. Well. I'm sure he can explain that reasoning, but you're including the two special ed teachers in this poll. No, what I, I said that generally the average at 24 to 1 in a self-contained elementary school, you very well may see that. In classes where it's not self-contained, you may have 22 in one class and 38 in another, and that is what we are seeing at, at, at her school right now. Matter of fact, this is one of the, I mentioned earlier we might have some request for some additional personnel because the average isn't a good indicator of the central tendency that we're seeing in there. So uh, actually the two middle schools are, are the ones making those requests. I want to make a comment. The concern I had last year about the substitute teachers is number one, we were paying a couple hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And what I was also hearing at that time last year is that it wasn't even being prorated if we, we decide that we want to go to an hourly rate because if that teacher left after two hours, they shouldn't have been given a full daily rate of pay. <coughs> so we looked at what was competitive at that time and what we thought was fair and, and maybe because we were looking at that sheet right there, we were trying to do whatever we could last year to deal with an amount of money that we allocated in the budget, I don't remember what it was, but 400,000 for substitutes, we thought was astronomical. We thought it was way too high. We looked at how that was being paid out, and you'll see that we made a significant savings in that area this year. Maybe we went too low. Apparently that is what uh, Mida is seeing right now. Maybe we went too low, but, but last year the premise, as I just mentioned, is exactly what my thoughts were at that time. And I remember having that discussion with the leadership team and the admin team. Mr. Chair, may, may I ask, you said there's eight people. We're talking about five bucks an hour. How much money are we talking about here? I did a quick calculation right before I came up to the podium. And we're talking about $16,000 because it's about 50 more days through the end of the school year. Um, it's eight, eight hours a day, five more dollars. And it's about eight people, so we're we're looking at about sixteen thousand more dollars. But the, this amount of money is actually budgeted for already because we are contracting these people in lieu of a certificated teacher. So the line item for that certificated teacher is what has been budgeted and employee related expenses. So our starting salary for teacher at a BA one is twenty nine thousand seven hundred ninety five dollars plus twenty five percent. So this course, amount is budgeted. Yeah, of course that was my next question. Is it is it contemplated within the budget we did adopt that we would have enough money to do something like this? Correct. Ideally, you know, we don't want to fill positions with substitute teachers, but it happens, and perhaps we did not anticipate that when we were restructuring the sub rate. Another. Uh, restructuring that occurred too was, was that retired subs were being paid double the rate. And that was a change that we made last year, anticipating too the increase in the alternate contribution rate that we'll have to be paying for retired employees. But like uh, Ms. Suniga stated, the, these monies are budgeted for vacant positions, are budgeted at an MA9 uh, placement on the salary schedule, 
And if we are paying 29,000, there's just about a $10,000 savings on each position that we fill with a long-term sub at this new rate. At the lower rate, we, our, our savings would be greater, therefore increasing our carryover. Um, small adjustments, Mr. Chair, my position would be, would be uh, small adjustments. People are asking us to help. The principals are asking us to help. It's within the budget. I would support it. Any more discussion? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, he, here again, uh, I understand the deal about uh, having the full-time substitute, which, number one, I don't agree with having full-time substitutes, even though uh, I know that it does come out once in a while. And I understand Mrs. Montiel's concern, and, and I guess that Mrs. Montiel knows better of what should be done in her school to help her be successful. And uh, $18,000 is still $18,000. I, I wish all of these things would be taken into consideration when we're talking about the budget so we don't come after the fact to try and correct. Even though in education we say we monitor and adjust. And I am also concurring with Mr. Arana's comments. And, and, and I want to be helpful, though, too. So I will take back my contention and I will support the issue. Bless you. Any more discussion? All in favor of, uh, of the motion for long-term substitute teacher rate for 2011-2012 school year, say aye. 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 Mm -hmm. Passes unanimous. Okay, Chair, we'll entertain a motion to convene to executive session. Move to convene to executive session. Second. All right. Everybody say aye. 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 Okay. To uh, call the meeting back to order. I need to move. No, just call it back to order. Back in order. Back in order. All right. Chair will entertain a motion on the two action items approval of Senate Bill 1204 position statement and two approval of superintendent contract. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that action items one and two be tabled. Second. Any discussion? Can't discuss. All right. All upper, in favor? Up or down? Say aye. 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 All right. Governing Board future request. Mr. Chairman, the only item that I have is that on, on our next meeting, we're, we're going to be talking with a contract of citizens out of stage. I would just. Study session. Yes, yes, well, whatever. But I would just like you to get an, uh, uh, an attorney's opinion if I can now legally participate because of a previous conflict of interest. I just want to get it in writing. Otherwise, I'm not even going to show up if I don't. So your conflict of interest is you served with them before? No, I, I was on their payroll. Oh, okay. But you now have no financial No, nothing, interest. nothing. And it's been over a year, so I don't have anything with them now. But I just want to make sure that. Okay. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Hector? Nothing from me, Mr. Chair. Nothing here. Uh, entertain a move, a motion to adjourn meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.